<laughs> okay, so today I am with four excellent left wing people um, for a nice casual hangout, a nice chance to talk to people that perhaps I don't often get to a chance to, uh, uh, certainly in my circles anyway. Um, today with me, I have the lovely Lapis or effeminate degenerate, the <laughs> great geek. Um, actually, I don't know what your Twitter at is presently. Um, uh, quite a bit. It's, it's, yeah, it's, right now I am the uh, resolution, uh, New Year's resolution, revolution. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, the wonderful wolf, lonely wolf. Um, who certainly is not lonely tonight, um, <laughs> and <laughs> the amazing Amelia, who I don't think I've had on this channel before. Um, nope. So it's uh, excellent to be seeing you on here for the first time, Amelia. Yes, likewise. So yeah, um, we're planning on just having a you know, nice general um, casual chat. Um, I've not done one um, this year, so it'll be nice to... Uh, <laughs> So, I was appalled. I was appalled. I was appalled that you were like playing, um, because you did a gaming thing, and I was like, it was what is it, Grand Theft Auto? <laughs> and, I was like, and I was thinking, oh my god, that's that's so. Um, I can't do those sort of games. Like I do the, I do the little like Facebook type games that people play. The, like what was it called, Fish World, where you just like buying little fish for your aquarium and feeding them, and that's the extent. That's how. <laughs> that's the extent of my edginess when it comes to gaming. And uh, I'm a true gamer. Um, Captain, Captain. <laughs> Rise up. <laughs> um, but no, I um, no, certainly I, I enjoy quite an array of games. Um, so FIFA is my main uh, sort of favourite. I'm quite a big fan of football. Um, but no, GTA, um, I, I've got a cricket game that I quite enjoy. Um, I'm not really a big fan of like modern releases, really. Aside from FIFA, um, it's more like um old free games basically like um for christmas um i treated myself to a game called imperial glory which sounds just utterly like against all the sort of principles i have because it's like an old um <laughs> it's an old strategy game that i got um that i used to play like at a friend's house like years and years ago um and essentially it's set in like napoleonic europe and um, you get five European powers to choose from, and you've got to take over the map. Um, <laughs> and it's actually quite fun. I, I really enjoy it. Because um, it's like um, you get like, in-game camera battles with like um, armies, navy. Um, you've got to manage the country. Like You can choose whether to become a democracy or an autocracy. Um, it's actually quite enjoyable. Which and... one do you choose? <laughs> um, I actually chose democracy. <laughs> Because you um <laughs> right. it, you improve your like neighboring um trade relations um and thus get right. more get more money. Um but I um obviously <laughs> played as Britain, um, but it didn't go very well. I mean mm -hmm. I um I, I took over like part of um northern Africa, but then got kicked out by the French. Uh so <laughs> no, I, I can't profess to be like any good at those sort of games, but it was a nice bit of um, nostalgia. Uh, well, what games, if any, do you, um, the rest of you play? Oh, I play Civilization V, Crusader Kings 2, Stellaris. Um, I, I really do love the Civilization series. That's anything, like, sorry, you could continue. Anything where you have a control of a, a nation or a country um, is, is kind of my cup of tea. Yeah like sims on a wider scale i suppose you could say that yeah <laughs> um it sounds a bit similar to um the game i was just talking about um mm -hmm. it's one where you like start them off as like um early hominids and they gradually evolve to like the you know biggest force on the planet and stuff isn't it um it, that sounds like spore oh well i, I thought spore was based on civilization though oh it, yeah i think it is and Oh, I suppose I kind of misunderstood what you said. Yes, I, I I suppose that is kind of the point of civilization. You start off with one city and then you gradually grow to a vast empire. Yeah, exactly. How about the rest uh, of you? Uh, Geek, what games have you been playing? Oh, uh, what games have I been playing recently? My God. Uh, oh, Smash Brothers, guys. My oldest brother. I live with my oldest brother who's 
liberal, but cool for most things, except he doesn't understand anarchism, found that out. And then my youngest brother, who I've talked about before, Trump voter, gaming gear, blah. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, um, wait a minute, why did I do that? I why know. did you do that? Oh, no, never mind. It's just something on my end. It's like uh, Google Hangout thought it was like, oh, are you screen sharing? Well, this is what it'll look like. And, but I didn't screen share, I don't think. And Actually, like no, it's, um, it's Wolfie's screen sharing, but because you were speaking. And oh, so that's why I saw myself on the screen. So I was like, yeah. weird. I was like, what's going on here? But <laughs> okay, so that's what happened. <laughs> uh, uh, Smash Bros. is what I'm currently playing. Uh, uh, not much other than that. Uh, well, I still have like a game, say, on like sweet home my sexy roommates because oh. yes i am a, a yes i do play the hentai unfortunately <laughs> uh <laughs> house party is also something i play that's also a porn game on steam uh not much else been watching a lot of anime though uh like a uh, hero's mask on the, uh netflix from studio piro is actually quite interesting i've only saw the first three episodes of it is sci-fi with like near future and crime drama so it's quite interesting it's because like chrissy winters on twitter has said hey summer and a geek you have netflix don't you why don't you do a video on the top 10 anime on netflix and i was like okay Wait a minute, I haven't seen only anime on Netflix. Let me do that first, then make a video or something like that. Um, so that's why. Have you seen any anime on Netflix? What? Have you seen anywhere near the anime on Netflix? About half of them. So, and that's another suggestion that Christy Winner has made. Mm -hmm. I can do a recommendations of anime on Netflix right now and then watch all of them or all the ones I want to watch and then go back and say, well, here's now the updated list. And especially since anime is always coming. It, Usually it's coming out on Netflix. So, uh, but Civilization, Civilization Two in the past, oh, I love that game. My whole family loved that game and stuff like that. And now that I, my political views have like changed drastically in the like last two years or something like that, I am interested to in going back and like playing like, Civilization. And I wonder what kind of decisions I will make and stuff like that. But that game, when you're a leader in like Civilization or these kind of strategy games, Total War and stuff like that, you can't form an anarchist society or social society you oh no you can't form a social society and a communist society state communists and state socialist societies unfortunately as it were based on history uh but you can't really form an anarchist society because it you always need a leader as a like the uh, like the player um like the player uh mm -hmm. proxy in these games and stuff like that yeah. so that's quite interesting but still fun for like all the battling and stuff like that and plus it's a fantasy so you can be a total capitalist oligarchy totalitarian dictator if you want to as well and i will stop talking and let the others talk it's an interesting um statement actually on just the topic of um control and agency um beyond the scope of the framework of the game so for instance um i heard um ian danskin of innuendo studios a very very good channel um he um mentioned that in the in a game of football you don't touch the ball with your hands because it's against the rules and it's you know the unwritten you know you don't break rules in a game of football you're competing uh, along the game you know in rules to be a good sportsman um in a game of FIFA on your, your your console, you don't touch a ball with your hands because it's physically impossible. You know, you can't, there's no option for your player characters, the medium for which you're playing the game to you know, stop and pick up the ball. Um, and it's, you know, like you said in um, the uh, civilization, um, you know, you can have these forms of government or, you know, what the developers thought were these forms of government, I guess, um, but you can't then have the actual model for which you and many others view society through um gta um I, you know in in the stream i was doing i was thinking you know i'm making all this money but outside of inputting what i actually want you know what the game lets me i, I couldn't say you know develop my money into a um, new type of business I, I couldn't i couldn't become a legitimate mm -hmm. business in gta i couldn't um you, you get like there's um npcs uh not um which are homeless um you mm -hmm. see homeless characters that you can't give money to them like there's no despite that you've got like you know millions you can't do anything for anyone but yourself really or spend yeah, money right. on the uh form of the game um you know it's it's interesting things like that which um it, it just makes you think really um <laughs> I think, uh, speaking of, um, or continuing the uh, games topic, the next person on my screen 
uh, is Wolf, who um, was playing a game just a second ago. Uh, do you want to tell us what you yeah, were playing? Yeah, I was just, I was just, um, yeah. This is this is why I put it up just so people could see that. Um... Oh, hang on, I've got something unlocked. Okay, <laughs> this is like my fish world. It's a very, very soft. It's a very mild mannered. It's a game for the very mild mannered people like me. <laughs> I mean, I used to in my adolescence, I used to enjoy the um, like the the 90s kind of games like streets of rage or whatever but mm. now i just play the it's like a, this is kind of a meditative thing it's just um because you sort of design it takes like you want to sort of it, it takes a lot of time to get as many decorations it's just a matter of um you know growing your fish and then selling them and then um sorry i cut out for and you. then and then doing like daily there's like daily challenges where you might have to um like you go fishing to catch something or um like you play like slot machines or whatever to earn pearls. It's one of those, it's a very mild minute game. And then apart from that, I'm, I've got an addiction to, um, I mean, there's some reality television that I, I watch the real housewives and I also have a big thing for soap operas, probably the American, not so much the English ones like Coronation street or, or the Australian, <laughs> but the American, the American soap operas are my, um, like addiction. I don't think I've seen many American soaps actually. Um, <laughs> are they um, are they are they similar to the British ones? Um, just with obviously the, American uh, voices. Well, the American ones are more, more much more over the top, like sort of mellow, <sighs> like because like, with the ones like Coronation Street, most of the time they're just in the pub and they're like standing around speaking <sighs> or whatever, and they might have a few things. But well, you know, let, let me tell you, they <laughs> There's some interesting <laughs> stuff that happens in the. Well, I say interesting. Yeah. There's some. It's um, like, out like there dead stuff. bodies and all that. Yeah. Like sometimes <laughs> there's a dead body that's underneath. It's it's always the same trope as whenever there's a construction work going on and they have to, you know, uncover the concrete. There's always going to be a dead <laughs> body. Um, but I think the the American ones they just go way out. They go like further over the top with the evil because I, I love all the tropes. The evil mm. twins, the baby switch. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's something I've noticed about British, I mean, American soap operas. Don't they usually tend to star the super rich? Whereas mm -hmm. British soap operas seem to concentrate on the lower classes. Mm. Like mm. Um, EastEnders is set in the East End of London. Coronation Street is set in a you know, working class terraced housing in Manchester. Um, mm -hmm. em Emmerdale is actually set in like a, a co country village, which is, you know, more of the upper class sort of centre. But... Um, yeah, going back to what Wolf was saying, some of the stuff that happens in those soaps, like the um, the pub in Coronation Street is called Rover's Return In, but it's like on a street which has a um, an old you know viaduct which is obviously turned into like a train line, um, but in one of the um, episodes, the train like falls off the carriage and like smashes into some terraced housing, and there's also like a gas leak which causes like a big explosion and they kill off four characters. Um, and it's like, you know, of course, this all happens on this one street where, like, every other family has, like, a, a uncovered, like, murderer just lurk, <laughs> lurking. Or, you know, like, every, every other family's got, like, an affair going on. And <laughs> the characters who start out in the show as babies, like, end up growing up into uh, characters who also go on to have affairs and, you know, like, <laughs> misdemeanors. More babies. Stuff. Yeah. It's just nonsense. Um but and then it wouldn't be so bad but there's like weekly episodes and not more than weekly because it's like they do um coronation street Om omnibus um and it's like an anthology of like the week's episodes and it's like you're, you're writing the same story over and over with pretty much the same characters in fact yeah. literally the same characters because you know the show's been going for like 50 years and they've still got some of the like original street members there um but yeah, it's it's a fascinating sort of world, really, because it's um, it's so predictable and obvious and cliche. Mm -hmm. But it's got a you know a very loyal, very passionate following. And you know, even you know, sometimes I can sit and I, you know I can sit and watch it sometimes because you know it's not <laughs> atrocious. My parents, <laughs> my parents are my parents are addicted to that. They watch it every day. <laughs> But they also watch the bold and the beautiful one, which is I'm not because I'm more of a Days of Our Lives fan. But the bold and the beautiful, it's what's what's really weird about that one is the it's almost a semi incestuous sort of. Oh. It's almost like there's only one. There's almost one family in there, and there's this. There's always this one 
the, like the women and they go through every member of the one family like a father and then the son and then even their own son and lords they end up and then the holy you know, ghost somehow <laughs> 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 I'm raised Catholic, so I was like, I was, if you weren't going to do it, I was going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, incest is actually a, one of the subplots on um, one of the other shows, too. Um, there were two Starcross lovers who later found out they were like cousins or something oh, because, yeah. because the parents hadn't told them about like the um, um, extramarital affair. So, <laughs> like, they yeah. did. Because of course, the one person you fall for just happens to be the illegitimate offspring of your mother or whatever. It's like <laughs> it's absurd. Like, and then and then it's like it's known that they're the biologically related for like months and months, but the families don't tell tell the kids because they're like, oh, should we tell them? Oh no, I, we couldn't break their heart. And then they end up finding out, and it's like just <laughs> just so convoluted. And in all this talk of soaps, Amelia, we've forgotten to talk about your games. Yeah. Um, what, what do you like playing? <laughs> I will share my screen here. I don't know how long it'll take to pick oh. up, but my on the exact opposite end of the spectrum from <laughs> the fish game on Facebook, I have been getting into Escape from Tarkov, uh, hardcore FPS, almost milsim. Uh, mm. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's pretty so intense it's fancy call of duty yeah i i uh i'm interested mechanically and historically in guns so games mm -hmm. like this just get me you know they've they've got me hooked like you can take apart every single part of your guns Ooh. and you can mod them it's Ooh. it's ridiculous yeah i you i was trying me for a while i was playing multiple games at the same time i was playing um that's probably how i do it too yeah I, I was playing il2 battle of stalingrad which is a flight simulator uh world oh, yeah. war ii flight simulator but uh it's best played with friends and I, it's just scheduling has made it not yeah. consistent um and i was also playing a lot of war thunder which is uh, another world war ii game uh mm -hmm. tanks and planes and stuff uh, but then I got this. Uh, someone gifted me a two-week, uh, like, free trial of it. Mm. And before the trial was even over, I had bought the game because it's just, uh. it's exactly right for me. Yeah, I know that not everyone's into this whole, like, military-type stuff, but it's, like, right in my wheelhouse because I'm an mil like, amateur military historian, and it's, like, mm. my my thing so yeah that's this is well, no, taking think, up all my time i think everyone um should have stuff they're interested in and it shouldn't matter whether it's niche or you know um not the most uh well heard of you know but you're it's... talking to an anime fan so don't worry <laughs> about that <laughs> uh, yeah, i mean if you saw the stuff that i watch i mean i think the uk is where i get most of my um guilty pleasures it's because because uh, I still watch all of those Simon Cowell. No, no, um, Lonely Wolf. When you've been over this, you don't call it a guilty pressure. You shouldn't feel guilty for anything you derive pressure from. Instead, no. call them great trash. Because if we cannot enjoy yeah. great trash as well as great movies, we should not go to the movies whatsoever. But anyway, you continue. <laughs> but it's um, yeah. There's something okay because the the same franchise like let's say it's x factor like the same franchise like in the other countries it's very cheap and it's kind of watered down but the uk like the contestants they let in like sometimes they bring in some feature like the i really love the last one because it was very like it was a very diverse place around the world like there were people from jamaica and then it sort of introduced people into that soccer sort of um like dance hall type music and mm. that's i love that i i fell in love with that kind of music that very exotic um like Caribbean um, fused with you know electro techno or whatever, and the dude who won, he was from um, actually got a Jamaican winner from that show, as huh. whereas they wouldn't um, get that from um, like the the ones from like Australia or whatever or America. It's mm -hmm. like it's not quite as um they're not quite as experimental in genres. Yeah, um, it's a. Co I mean, granted, um, I. Uh... Like I, the um, newer series of X Factor for me, like because I sort of watched it when I was younger. Um, it's it feels like I mean it was always like quite um, fake to use a want of a better word. Oh, it, like, oh, it is like overproduced, um, really cynical, very manufactured. 
but at the same time that's sort of the appeal of it and it's a bit um like it's a yeah. i mean when you when you boil it down it's a horrible show it's it's uh, oh, it, a man, it, it's horrible a man like Simon Cowell who knows full well that these people are making fools of themselves inviting them onto national television his producers obviously you know whittle out the ones that they think are going to be the most entertaining to watch um you know sometimes even sabotage like their auditions somewhat so like they, they had a few years ago mm. they were like auto-tuning people to sound better or worse and it's mm. like it's yeah at this point it's not even really a singing competition um but you know it's at the same time it's oddly entertaining some of the ones who go on there and like are, you know, genuinely like maybe not so much the newer ones because it's sort of a bit self-aware but for some ones back in the day who'd come on and start like screaming songs out to people and be just yeah. horrific. It's you know it is a little bit you know, the, it's entertaining. Yes, yeah, the the last three years, like the UK, it's like the, even the show, even though the show's trash, like the actual contestants themselves, they got like their own music collection. They got YouTube mm. channels or whatever, and they mm. they end up releasing like independent releases. And it's like it kind of gives you. It's actually quality music. It's um, mm -hmm. it's none of that because I'm sick of I'm sick of that mayonnaise vanilla stuff that I hear. Like you know, I want the spicy chili sort of stuff and. You get that from the places near the anywhere near the Caribbean, Jamaica or whatever, where they do like the um soccer music or um or dance hall. That's where you get the flavor. Mm. <laughs> well, I suppose but, you could also find that sort of flavor in Puerto Rico. Hmm. Yeah. I mean also, um because uh oh, I forgot what I was gonna say now. Um <laughs> Well, I'll just uh, interject while you're thinking about what you're trying to say. Yes, I am drinking, just in case we would talk politics, but it, uh, I'll continue to drink as is right now. And to replenish my drink, I have this, my class that, yes, looks like a Game Boy. Why is it not called Game Girl? Yeah, that's a fair question. But this is a Game Booze. <laughs> oh. Nintendo Game Booze. What's Nerd, in it? Nerd Tento. Ghost <laughs> Pies. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, and wow. And, was, and what is in it is gin. Because I'm going to prove to the internet it's possible to drink gin and not black out. Jeff Holiday, what's wrong with you? So anyway. Oh, yes. That Jeff Holiday character. Mm -hmm. I think he's oh, in the... that, I mean, that was cringy. It was, um... <laughs> what happened? I sort of... I, oh, um... Just what I mean, he absolutely shit the bed when he went on um, Kevin Logan's stream and just ranted this incoherent. Um, it was good for Kevin. I think it's a big score for Kevin because that may um, it might introduce him to a vast order. But maybe that's the opportunity for him to sort of engage was... with people who are kind of maybe it may be on the center or whatever. Okay, so was, I, was I will. The... Oh, you go ahead, Geek. Yeah, yeah. What happened is like uh, last week or something like that. So uh, Kevin Logan was planning and scheduled to do a stream with Kraut and T to settle the beef. It was Kraut wanted to do the stream. Okay, so yeah, yes, we can settle this, the beef that they have with Kevin Logan about like the Discord server or something like that. That drama that Kevin and Christy uh, covered a lot on their show, the Kevin and Christy Half Hour, which I am a mod of and I'm friends with them and I'm a mod for their Facebook group oh, as well. So. And uh, so, but Crowd and T basically was only on for like nine minutes. First of all, he they planned for like the schedule to be at one time, and then Crowd said to Kevin, "Let's have this thirteen hours earlier or something like that." If I remember correctly, they talked this to, on the stream, and Crowd was only there for like nine minutes, didn't want to settle the beef, and then gave the hangout to Jeff Holiday, who then came on, and. He was drunk during that whole thing as well. And it's, well, they went, Kevin and Jeff went on for like four to five minutes because Jeff was accusing Kevin Logan of being the worst person ever for going on the Ralph or Cortill stream or something like that. And yeah, yeah he was not making good arguments. Yeah. He was drunk. He was belligerent. Uh, he was talking, they kept, since Jeff Holiday make fun of like Kevin Logan's death life in a way, Kevin Logan brought up how Jeff Holiday's wife, Memory Holiday, mentioned something on Twitter about like going out with other women or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so then Kevin Logan brought up that. And while Jeff was combating that, being very vulgar, it, his kid was in the background. His seven year old kid was in the background mm. hearing all this and hearing Jeff Holiday yeah. person as well. So it, and it was a. What did your father? 
Yeah, it, it basically was yeah. like a kind of a shit show. But then Ke Kristen and Kevin did like a four hour stream afterwards, just like going through all of the bits and basically laughing at Jeff Holiday, who later yeah. the next day basically said on like Twitter, I'm not drinking ever again. I never blacked out since high school. Oh, and that's God. the last time I'm doing that. And so he would have, I mean, he would have had a big meltdown regardless of what happened because the, I mean, obviously, right. because mm -hmm. people have, I mean, people have falling outs all the time. I mean, I sort mm -hmm. of, um, like I had a little bit of a, um, you know, falling out with the um, the Windows group, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to hold on to bitterness. Like I'll still go onto her like channels, and yeah. you know, I I I like her videos, and then like I interact with her on YouTube, and mm -hmm. it's yeah. um, when you when you pour, when you hold on to such resentment for such a long time, and to actually say you know that these two like Kevin and Christy are the worst people in the world, they're worse than Nazis. They're worse than neo Nazis. That's <laughs> what Jeff Holiday said. So yeah. Gosh. Yeah. It yeah, seems really like the. No, no, you go ahead, Lapis. Oh, uh, why, why, thank you, Owen. I, I have to admit, I'm a, la a, a tad tired of the drama between annoying anti SJW centrist YouTube, um, Christie's little faction, other leftists. It's just a bit of a distraction, I think, from the main focus, which is, I think, the alt right. Yeah. It yes. seems like people really need to get their priorities straight. Like, are mm -hmm. we going to bother canceling people uh, because of their associations? Or are we going to actually combat these, you know, dangerous ideas which are already leading to, you know, death and displacement all over the world? And to be fair, like uh, Kevin Logan does, uh, he in fact like mentioned this. Like, okay, I did a PragerU FU video countering all the arguments from one prior you video i source it i research it i put a lot of effort to it and it gets only like ugh, 500 views yet that little tiny video of like the compilation of all the jeff moments from the jeff stream and the jeff stream itself get thousands and thousands and thousands of views and so yeah mm -hmm. it, it, it but to your point yeah i do kind of like uh, agree that like it, and sometimes you can like place your efforts better in like other places and stuff like that. But it also is kind of like I, I'm an anarchist, so I can't really tell anyone else what to do. So I, I I'll <laughs> try to avoid like the policing as well as like yeah. uh, it's gonna be out there. Yeah. yeah, I mean the only I mean I sort of I I, I said this to Kate, like as an opinion. I just said um the only thing that I disagreed with is I like I understand it'd be frustrating to be always called you know all these names calling you a cuck, a soy boy, uh, um like beta male. And the word cuck, and it was, um, I think that was like, I didn't agree with, um, when it came to sort of Jeff Holiday to sort of come back and use those, those same sort of words. Like it's, um, it's, yeah, I, I've never agreed with those particular words. Um, yeah. I just said, like, attack him any other way. Um, you can call him the C word or whatever, but <laughs> it was just the, um, I just, I just said, I don't really agree with you sort of going, going down it, no matter how hard it is, no matter how much you're being baited, you know, and don't, um, for, don't forget don't that. Go. Sorry. Oh, the MPC meme is what I think. Oh, the MPC. Mean. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. That, that was a, that's a fail. I mean, it's, um, it's like, it's like throwing a grenade, but it's halfway between you and your targets and you're yeah. both blown up in the process. <laughs> Oh my me, god! The meme, the, the meme, it, it comes across like the sort of thing that's like scrawled a bit of paper that you just like see lying around. It's like, oh, let, let's think of something we can just scribble out in like ten seconds. Oh, here we go, NPC. You, the you're, worst. The, you're the same as computer characters that don't have lives or whatever. Like the worst yeah. part about it is that the way that they had to post it, because the inherent way that memes work made them look like NPCs because they were all posting the exact same meme in the exact same way, exact same yeah. wording. So they're like, you just see like a hundred people say exact same phrase. Oh, you're just an NPC, just like over and over again. You're like, um, yeah, are, do you guys not see yourselves? Cause yeah, mm -hmm. like, yeah. yeah. Like how many times? I mean, I've read a thousand times, like a thousand times, the same comment over and over again. Um, oh, I identify as an attack helicopter. Feminism oh, is gosh, cancer. Yeah. Cuck, 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 cuck. Mm -hmm. Or like, like for socialism, yeah, it's it's actually actually out of people's money. That one, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, I think it's quite a um, you know, common trend with um, quite a lot of right wing groups, really, in that the. Um, things they say about other people is largely a lot of the time a projection of their own insecurities and ideas. So, for instance, um, you look at the 
amount of nonsense that's spoken about with socialism where it's like oh um under socialism you're all going to be living lives of dour misery um you're gonna you know, you're, everyone's get, you're gonna not gonna have a control of your life you're gonna be working and living in little square boxes yeah mm-hmm. you're gonna be own nothing and then you look at capitalist society where you know landlords can just hoover up the entire property market of an entire city um yeah. where factories are you know these grim sweat boxes designed mm-hmm. to squeeze as much profit out of each worker's you know day-to-day life livelihood um, oh but it could be worse you could be living in this country you could be living in this country what about <laughs> venezuela uh, yeah socialism works because they are lining up for bread lines and stuff like that oh god yeah. the, um, it, interestingly like you um you, know, you speak to them and say oh you know Oh, you know, Venezuela is not a socialist country. It's you know, it's not worker owned mm-hmm. by no means. It's got a private sector. You know, mm-hmm. it's quite under any scrutiny. It just doesn't fit. And then it's like, oh, well, actually, they tried socialism and it just went bad. And it's like, well, you know, firstly, they didn't, and secondly, yeah. that's not what you said a second ago. You know, you, you just <laughs> changed your argument. Um, and just, you know, it's so blatantly dishonest and you know disingenuous. Um, and it just sort of, you know, I've got a. Um, real cynicism about the majority of the people making these arguments because i you know they're either you know really misinformed which is yeah. hard, not exactly hard to believe given the amount of indoctrination that lots of people mm-hmm. you know sort of receive or you know completely like deceitful which is also not hard to believe because you know i mean anyone who sort of looks at the state of a lot of conservative discourse sees it for what, what it is um yeah well this, I, I... you know garbage like trite Go ahead, Lapis. I think um, about the deceit, I'm not necessarily sure how intentional it is among the, you know, the layman, but right, among the, you know, the kind of the thought leaders, you know, your Candace Owens, your Charlie Kirks, I think it is very intentional. Like mm. we see Charlie Kirk, you know, uttering like pretty much, you know, he's basically supporting Bolsonaro yes. in Brazil. Well, basically, giving, he is. He is. Um, <laughs> He, he just, he, you know, he's giving a whole bunch of apologisms and saying, oh, he's so great. He's like the Trump of the tropics, <laughs> <laughs> which oh, you know, make, makes um, Trump look extremely bad because Bolsonaro, you know, you know, he, he straight up says, I wish Pinochet had killed more people. The only <laughs> problem, you know, the only failure of the military regime was torturing and not killing. Like these mm. are real quotes. You can look them up. He's. Mm-hmm. He just he says these evil evil things, and he he pretty much ad- he's he's admitted before that he wants to make himself a dictator. Uh-huh. So what you, so um but but it doesn't matter really because Bolsonaro also wants to liberalize the economy, and that will um you know in- increase the profits that are of the people who are paying Charlie Kirk. Mm. But I live like a capitalist every day. I live like a capitalist every day, Jake. <laughs> it's. I think why um, so much of you know the conversation needs to um, shift to talking about them rather than to them. You know, we mm-hmm. should see them as like imagine you're studying life in a little petri dish. Like you should be observing it. You shouldn't be sort of treating it like a you know oh the debate partner, an equal in the um, you know field of discourse. Yeah. Um, but rather a um, you know, product of the capitalist system. You know, commodifying everything in sight um yeah. bolsonaro you know he's this awful man who you know it makes you know no sense to defend him <clears throat> unless you're you know um in the pretty common position of wanting to accrue more capital and so you know suddenly the completely you know oblivious uh, not oblivious the completely abysmal nature that um bolsonaro um has whether it's the deregulation the destruction of the environment um the you know, rampant anti-LGBTQ um, yeah. and, you know, racism, militarism, all those things, you know, they're good for business. You know, the shareholders of corporations that benefit from those things, like deforestation, yeah. like military contractors, you know, they're, they're going to have more money. And under capitalism, why would you not then support them? And like you said, Lapis, you know, Charlie Cook, who's funded by people explicitly, you know, benefiting from this, is always going to put out just anything he types it's like um so yeah obviously the deceit is there i think also though deceit is not just limited to um 
you know, the, the, the big leaders. There's also people who benefit from deceit because it's a self-fulfilling um, statement about themselves. It's, it's a self-fulfilling lie. They get to pretend they're in the right if they willingly ignore the, um, you know, logic in the argument. It's like um, people who tell themselves, like, oh, you know, the gays are doing X, Y, Z. The gays are doing this. There, there's no evidence for any of that. There's no basis for saying that. But, you know, if you start to look at the evidence and start to consider actual reason, then suddenly the entire life you've been living of, you know, hatred and um, blind, like, conservatism and stuff just sort of falls apart. You know, you, what basis do you have for it? What kind of person have you been? So the necessary response and pathway becomes one of just doubling down on anything, you know, insisting you're right, regardless of what's, you know, actually the truth. It's why you still see the same people saying, oh, you know, the, the gay lifestyle is decaying our values or, you know, whatever nonsense they've rephrased it to this week. It's, the gay agenda. Yeah, yeah. And just substitute gay for whatever marginalised group you're trying to get rid of this time. Like Transgender ideology. <laughs> yeah, because I sort of, I, so I always challenge people from um, the ones who sort of, you know, that they've, got a very simplistic model of biological sex they might have you know passed like that but then um you know like from a mathematical viewpoint you just ask them you know if you were given this data and you didn't know what it was you know would you put it into two boxes you know it's like a histogram bin with only two categories and it's like the answer would be no because you know some of the variables are continuous so they'll be mapped on a like normal distribution like some of them might have um you know um like different categories or whatever. Like there's some that might have only like one or two, that's fine, but you know, because of the number of variables and some of them are continuous. So therefore it it's like if you were any reasonable person who's done a first year course in data analysis, like would treat that data very differently. Um like if they didn't know what it was. Like that's the argument that I always put forward from a um because for me the science is a little bit um edgy. Like even though <laughs> Even though I identify as um, NB, like it's like science is not really my. I argue more from a, I guess, a cultural point of view that it's a, um, that it's kind of a universal cultural trait that there's a sort of gender ambiguity, and it's sort of evident mm -hmm. throughout sort of history that there's been a, that androgyny is sort of a natural part of culture. Like even if it's evolutionary, um, even though evolutionary like is sort of like asexual as well, like that's taken me out of the gene pool, but there's still a. And that's what a lot of people need to think that um, because we have like sort of dissident sexualities, no matter what they are, and mm -hmm. people might have the argument saying, you know, um, well, it's against, you know, evolution. It's sort of, you know, um, you know, you're not contributing to the gene pool. But at the same time, the, um, like what we have to remember is there's a cultural contribution that comes from, you know, um, that sort of dissidence. Mm. I think um, that wasn't to sound arrogant. I um, see it as something that's not very hard to understand when you give it like a few minutes of thought, if that makes sense. So yeah. the, you know, the idea um, that science um, is being like thwarted is you know, almost the complete you know, opposite of what's actually happening, where um, yeah, we've got biological studies of the body, which show you know, reproduction and just different components of um, sexuality and just the body itself. But then suddenly you're like, oh, this is male, this is female. And you've just sort of lumped no, together no. everything into these two like ridiculous boxes, which don't, mm. which aren't consistent within themselves, which ignore you know, the evolution of science and you know, of, of our understanding. And they are actively just sort of sabotaging yeah. the improvement of the understanding of the body just to continue like doing it. To the point where you know the you get people like the Nazis who just burn down the site, the like evidence because you know they want they just ref outright refuse to have any you know um, yeah deviance from their ridiculous mindset. I mean, even when they use the chromosome sort of things, like it's not only because um, I I only had a brief look at an article or something like that. Um, like basically, it's. You know, they're obviously, obviously, chromosomes have got a certain, um, like, there's a predictive characteristic of what will happen if you've got this chromosome. But then, you know, within the cells, there's also other genes that are, like, apart from the XY chromosomes that, mm. 
that contribute towards um, secondary sex characteristics. Like it's something that they're still trying to map out. Exactly. Mm. And how, how I yeah. always like kind of like argue against that uh, is like, well, I don't know my chromosomes. And I, someone had their chromosomes tested because you had to test to determine what is your chromosome makeup. And someone is single X and I'm bringing that up. So what is that person and stuff like that? And then bring up yeah. all the other combinations of chromosomes and stuff like that. So and I'm using like, science against them, essentially. <laughs> it's a, um, and it's also the sort of argument that, you know, these transfers make. It's um, it's one that they can sort of substitute X, Y, and Z. So it's like, oh, um, you know, oh, what your chromosomes must be this or that. And it's like, well, actually, there's more than this. Then it suddenly switches to, oh, your hormones. And it's like, well, actually, you, you can change your hormones. And it's um, not really a binary model. Oh, well, actually, your, your skeleton bones. And it's like, well, you know, you don't. Um, you can't tell someone's um, gender just from their bones because that's just a bit absurd, really, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, ah, and you know, gender models have always been men and women. And it's like, well, you know, well, there's actually um, lots of societies around the world that have more than two genders. And really, gender is uh -huh. just a social construct. Um, yes. And you, know, you just sub, they just sub one in for another and another. And they're, you know, quite blatantly ignoring science and stuff. But, you know, they're, they're conservatives. So, you know, they have tradition on their side and they've got. Um, yeah. you know, the societal, um, what's it called? Societal privilege and mm -hmm. um, systemic um, favoritism on their side. They can, you know, hierarchies. The fact that they have control of this medium to, um, you know, understand, um, yeah. not understand, to um, control discourse. Therefore, mm -hmm. they can say, oh, well, it's always been men and women because, you know, they've been in control of discourse for so long that. Mm -hmm. You know, it appears as though there have only been men and women. It's you know, it's um, silly. Let me just um, remove. Yeah, the I mean, sense, um, it's... <laughs> I mean, because when I mean, because we're not all notable uh, lack of common sense. <laughs> so you know, um, you can tell basic gender from bones, same as basic race. Lol. Uh, you... <laughs> What is basic? That has been debunked a million times. <laughs> <laughs> Let us see. Um, what are the options? Report, remove, put user in timeout, hide user on this channel. What should I do? You should hide him so he'll get the views. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're doing it on air, so we'll, well, I don't know. It's like we could do this by a committee. Yeah, I don't let's know. Put him on timeout. Um, this is your channel, yeah. so like I'm, and again, I'm Ericus. I can't tell you what to do, Owen, and stuff like that. <laughs> so it's gonna turn him up for five minutes. So hopefully, when he comes back, he'll um stop putting like yeah. eugenics bog wash in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Think about what you did. I mean, I mean, I'm sort of I'm disappointed because I had a really good conversation with Common Sense, like um on, like somewhere on stream, and I sort of told him my story, whatever, and he was sort of sympathetic, like. The thing is this, I mean, yeah, this is a, okay, yeah, we're, we're having an echo chamber, you know, so, but, you know, we, but, but we disagree with each other. I mean, we, I mean, we disagree with each other behind the scenes. And um, oh, yeah. the thing is, though, it's, it's not like, I mean, we've all been on streams with, like, people who are different from us. Like, for me, because it's my social realms, uh, like, people who, who disagree with me. Because I have a lot of friends in, in that, like, that side of the community. And then, you know, um... But Owen and Lapis, like they've been on so many streams with people who are right wing, so it's like, you know, we're just we're just sitting here just shooting the shit. We're not really, um... yeah. Mm. Plus, I mean, like, you know, if you're gonna put like hateful stuff in the chat, but it's, you know, not only hateful stuff, but stuff that you've been told why it's hateful like fifty thousand times. Like, I'm pretty <laughs> sure he's been in my last like five hangout <laughs> chats and yeah. until I blocked him on Twitter was always in my mentions saying, Ooh, well actually you can't just say this and you will have like ten replies of people saying, Oh well, you know, here's some links. It's like, oh well I'm not gonna read it. I'm just gonna yeah. say the same thing again. And it's yeah. like, you know, what's the point of just having someone around yeah. who's just gonna say stuff like that? Like Well <laughs> yeah. here's what I would say. I would say if all that that person is getting out of the stream is they enjoy doing this sort of shit posting. Then if you mute them or don't give them that platform, they'll just leave. But if they're actually interested in what we're saying, they'll stay and they don't need to be uh, able to speak or, or, or spewing this, this crap in order to watch. So if they do actually listen to us, that's great. And I think that's a good thing you're doing, but you don't, we don't need you. We don't you need the you part of that. <laughs> you can listen to us. We don't need to listen to you doing this stuff that like his okay. assumption was that we don't hear this all the time. Like we've heard all these arguments a million times. <laughs> I mean, like, 
I'm trans. I hear all this crap like every day of my life. I don't need another outlet when I'm just chilling in a stream. Yeah, mm. especially from some the common sense guy as well. Like, yeah, it's how, hilarious. How, oh, that's how arrogant do you have to be? Like, oh yeah, I, I'm the voice of common sense. Like, <laughs> he seems no, to have a high opinion yeah. of himself, but he's admitted to me before publicly that he doesn't actually read the responses you give him. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah. it, it's just of a waste of time engaging with him. Uh, I disagree I with you uh, in terms of engaging with right wing people. I do think there is a use in dialogue. Um, oh, yeah, but, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, it doesn't I, have to be a two way. It does have to be a dialogue. You do have to listen yeah. to what other people say, and there has to be mm -hmm. a mutual respect for the information that's being provided. It can't just be, I've yeah. provided this information, I'm now going to ignore it. You know. Well, that's exactly the thing. In order to have even a discussion with someone, you have to assume that the other person is there in good faith or else you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we're, we can't assume yeah. this guy is here in good faith because he's he's very clearly not. <laughs> yeah. and, and right, if he had know. shown any it's ounce wrong. of good faith, then we could, but we can't. <laughs> I mean, so, it is, it's, it's so inconsistent because I've, I mean, I think it was common sense guy. Like I sort of, I think I remember speaking to him for at some length on a, um, it was on a stream that I was on and, you know, I told him sort of my story and, you know, it was, it was very different, but I think, I don't know there's an inconsistency between what you're writing and what you're, what you're saying. Like you're probably yeah. better off on the, um, on the live stream, you'll probably present yourself a lot better. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, touching on what you said, Lapis, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Dialogue is really important. It's always important to be communicating. And I think it's, you know, it's really important to keep yourselves open and willing to um, try and you know, help people understand. Because, you know, it's always important to have a good heart, an open heart. But at the same time, um, we need to be wary of you know, people <laughs> who are quite blatantly using it yeah. as a tool to you know, either waste time cause dissent you know all those sorts of things also um like people have no obligation to engage with people oh, sure. so at the same while you know i enjoy talking um <laughs> just in general but you know <laughs> who doesn't enjoy talking <laughs> I <think> people <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah um you know just people um you know it's not like every single person should be oh I, i'm um gonna oh, yeah. debate you like <clears throat> and also people have um you know the opportunity to um cut people out of their you know their social space people have emotional needs and you know their own well-being to consider and if there's yeah. just some person mm -hmm. like oh why why are you a legitimate person please prove your existence to me now educate me it's mm -hmm. no one has to interact with that yeah. like regardless yeah. of the fact that you could you know you've got the like, because you know, people don't, that's the other thing as well. Lots of people don't, even when they're presented with a logical argument and all the sources and all the right tools, you know, they still have to use them. And a lot of people don't, even aside from politics, even when you just make an argument, like they often, you know, their opinion is pre ingrained. So the idea that every single person has to keep rolling the dice and, you know, changing and trying and trying with every single, you know, bigger and right winger out there is you know not not true at all but at the same time you know if you can if you have the capacity to it's good to try because you never know you might just start the spark which ignites oh it's i mean it's, 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 I, I, don't it's, have, it's, I don't have any delusion well conversation is like magic or something and you know you know if i just if i just make the perfect argument then all of a sudden you know i'll wave my magic wand his heart and will grow this Trump supporter will be transformed into a communist. Um, <laughs> Overnight, it, too! Yeah, Just I like know. in the movies! It, it, it doesn't work like that. But I do believe that um, th there is a certain importance to countering the narrative that the left is so weak and fragile and we hate debate. We can't discuss ideas. We're just so afraid of conversation. It's no, I, I don't, I'm not certainly like that. I, I, I adore conversation. Uh -huh. Although, you know, I, I, it also has to be conversation where there is good faith involved. And obviously, you know, there are people who take advantage of someone who wants to have conversation. You do have to be careful of that. You know, and I've run across a few of those people and it, it is useful to, um, you know, to put to, put a stop to it when it when you need to and, and to not just let yourself become a dupe. Mm -hmm. 
And also, it's like no one is obligated with your time. Yes, yeah. you have the freedom to speak, but no one else has the no one else has to listen to what you're saying. Mm. They have that choice as well, which is why block buttons are around and stuff like that, yeah. and hide this user or put the user in timeout and stuff I mean, like that. I mean, I mean, we're kind of <laughs> we're kind of busy. I mean, we're because a lot of our time is spent like we're kind of arguing between ourselves. Not 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 in a bad way, in a bad right. faith way, but you know, there there might be points where I think, okay, I don't um, you know, because I'm probably the I'm probably the fish out of the water or something like that, because I'm the one who's the social democrat. Um and everyone else here is socialist. It's yeah, so there's there, there's obviously a it's it's a diverse bunch in here. And then, you know, sometimes when it comes to sort of activism or whatever, it's like um, you know, I have a bit more of a incremental approach if i'm you know introducing sort of gender ideas like non-binary stuff i'm kind of very i kind of like dip my feet in the water very carefully before i um engage like what people can say yeah yeah or or at least put forward any sort of um arguments or whatever i just um i'm sort of careful about you know how i put it forward and um yeah and i'm, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit milder in my sort of activism and so so some people don't agree because i engage in i'm very good at the respectability politics when it comes to you know um the, the queer stuff that i talk about I, I mean i guess i'm um quite the opposite really um I, yeah, I, yeah. Um, well I, I i don't think i'm a particularly um rude person i, I don't like you know oh ah, and, like you start screaming at people or anything but at the same time um i think that it's important to be quite firm because i i feel as though um <clears throat> when you allow for um you know too much just civility and decency you allow the idea um that um you know the right wing mindset the um <clears throat> the transphobia the homophobia racism sexism all those you know forms of mar discrimination and marginalization they gain legitimacy in many a way and if there's no you know visible front of um aggression and attack to that um discrimination um then the fire that is needed to you know raise it is tempered somewhat um a lot, i've said this before but um i look back to the civil rights era um and we look at um people like martin luther king who a lot of people wrongly think was just some person who showed up one day and said oh racism is bad you know and everyone just <laughs> i let, have uh, a dream and, and yeah. yeah everyone just sort of wrote and down and then died and, and, and there yeah. was nothing else to it and the, the clan just like discarded their robes and like just joined society <laughs> and um, held held hands and stuff but no, it's, you know, King was. No, I mean, I, I I have a dream, but all all dreams matter. Yeah, like. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and you know, well, yeah, King. It's not all dreams. <laughs> he, he spoke of you know, um, loving one another and stuff, and of course, because you know that's a, that, that's at the core, that's the whole point. But to get there, you know, you got to recognise that. Yeah, there's a lot of you know bad wrong things which need to be stopped. Racism not just going to go away through compromise. It's gonna you know it's no compromise to be had with the oppressor with the you know the bad wrong deed. And yeah, it's true. Lots of people were uncomfortable with this. There's lots of letters that King got from you know these mm -hmm. um, whites, liberals, and conservatives who were like, oh well, you know, I I'd agree with you more if you weren't so aggressive about it. And it's <laughs> he like, responded you know, to those. The aggression was the whole reason that the debate yeah. was had in the first place. You know, if there was no aggression from the activists and the people who were raising the correct points, then you know, you you could it could well have been thirty years back. You could have still been in the midst of you know Jim Crow, maybe even the slavery and stuff. Um, yeah. Think to um, LGBTQ rights. You know, you don't get there by you know, just having having yeah. a conversation like um, with what's it called. Uh, I'm trying to think of a like uh, hey, gay, gay conversion therapist. You'd be like, oh, well, you've got some points, guys. Um, but uh, you know, maybe try and tone it down a bit, guys. It's like, no, there's clear wrong. You know, gay conversion therapy. All those people, these like you know the fundamentalist religious types. You know, they're clearly wrong. You don't compromise with people who are like that. Um, and while I, you know, I, I um, obviously it's important to still speak to them and you know be 
I, I'm not saying, you know, to make their lives a living hell or anything. But at the same time, um, I think that firmness is you know, needed at the forefront of stuff. It's important to um, place that pressure on, you know, make, make it clear that the bigotry that has been around isn't going to stand. Because I, I see it also as, you know, the consequence of bigotry is marginalized people, you know, being um, the targets of violence and abuse and harassment and, you know, getting murdered and stuff. And you get p um, people like Bolsonaro in Brazil who have built their um rise to power yeah. off the you know targeting oh you know we're losing our values yeah. and you know putting that on um lgbtq people and black people and yeah. women and all that sort of stuff um I've, I've, lost, I've lost my temper maybe once or twice this year 2008 so sorry last year it was what um it was what what sort of disappoints me the most about the probably the worst thing in the lgbt community is sort of um the, it's this sort of the playing of the letters against each other that's um, this kind of one-upsmanship or something like that. It's mm -hmm. it's sort of the ones that have been thrown out. I mean, the ace people, um, asexuals and trans people and bisexuals, those are the three letters that have been under a lot of scrutiny because people are sort of, you know, a lot of people are looking at them saying, oh, you don't look, you're not queer enough because you're yeah. bisexual. You know, you're in a, you're like, you're in an opposite sex, you know, relationship. So therefore, like, you know, or... They look at someone who's asexual, and then it's always this, you know, comparison. And then, I you know, and trans people have got that, and um, and I've got a, you know, a, a fellow like um, you know, a friend of mine on Twitter, Mikaya B, who is a mm -hmm. YouTube content. Imagine what that would be like. You're a trans, a trans man, and an asexual, and so that's like a double. I think he deleted his uh, YouTube channel, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, but, but he's, uh, I mean, he's going through double yeah like double mm -hmm. thing it's like the um yes. for being x and for being trans you got like two trucks that are running mm. well but yeah exactly like the um you know this you know, intersectionality isn't it the idea of um our um axes of discrimination um and marginalization can um cross sex and you know sadly for lots of queer people that takes place over two three sometimes four you know axes um i think we have to be um uh, you know lo loads of um far-right groups put a lot of effort into breaking up marginalized groups so like for instance i see a lot of um you know supposed accounts saying oh well i'm gay and i don't think trans people are a thing um and you know you look at their you look at them and it, it turns out they're just like a far-right puppet account um <laughs> there's so oh. many of them like and sadly, they fool a lot of people who, you know, are, you know, A, looking for an easy way to say, oh, the left is bad, but B, just not in the know. Um, Why I left the left? <laughs> is that what someone put in the chat? No, they mentioned Dave Rubin, so that's why oh, I called yeah. him. He made a rather infamous video on... Um... Prager U. What, what's it called? Yes, Prager U, who is actually not a university, but they pretend no. to be. They're funded also heavily by a lot of far right or, mm. or libertarian right to libertarian capitalists like oil companies and stuff like that. So it's like I don't I have not I, I have not I do not watch their videos and I don't think there's any video that's actually factually accurate. They get like Jordan Peterson to do videos and a couple like that, and they get like Stephen Crowder to do videos, and so yeah, um whatever subject they want to talk about that Prager you approves and stuff like that. Yeah. I find it actually a really good example of how capitalist society commodifies information. Um, you've got people with so much capital, so much wealth, pouring their resources into making people less informed and making people less likely to question the hierarchy. So, you know, you're pouring your money and saying, oh, well, actually, climate change isn't that bad. You know, it's not really. Yeah, happening. exactly. Oh, um, it's, uh, it's better to have this our society because, you know, we earned our money um, and, mm -hmm. you know, they put their money into ensuring there's people who are going to fight their cause for them. You know, these people who you know, are politically completely, you know, no clue about anything, like don't have a clue how society works, no idea about the economic reality of America. Um, and, you know, they don't even have to pay them because we're just watching their videos on YouTube for free. Um, it's a miserable state of affairs, but it's in a really you know, sad, um, situation in the terms of you know how people are losing out on information despite us living in the age of the internet where we should have more information than ever 
you know, but sadly, you've got, I mean, and we started to see advertising, um, well, I say started, but it already is, but yeah. look at the amount of um, traffic uh, these websites can generate through pasting their adverts everywhere, you know, TV, um, YouTube, um, physical advertising and stuff, posters. Um, I saw an advert in um, London for Jordan Peterson's book, like just on the side of the subway. It's like, no, it's everywhere it's in every yeah. facet of our you know every medium you could think um and you know it's people with capital actively sabotaging information and you know actual genuine debate or their own wealth and it's a perfect example of how capitalism is inherently corrosive to um you know information um but then you know they'll insist oh well, actually uh, you know we've made anyone's free to do what we're doing <laughs> we've got like a, a billion more dollars than you so you know good luck yeah. competing <laughs> it, it, we're all free but we have we what we have instead is illusion of choice so many polit many different political positions but yet for there america for sure and true in like uk and in britain only two big political parties that actually get power and, and like these that. parties are basically part of, you know, a larger superstructure, a greater kind of party of business. Sure, you know, the yes. Republicans have more reactionary social policies and the Democrats yes. usually tend towards more superficial social liberalism. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, both parties still serve the interests of the military industrial complex, the prison industrial complex. And mm -hmm. um, what, what, it, what differs is the wings of capital that they represent. Uh, I suppose you might say that the Republicans represent more kind of oil, you know, coal, the traditional industries, whereas the Democrats tend to represent the new technologies, the up and coming capitalist class in Silicon Valley and Wall Street and um, soft power like finance. And um, while well, it has to be said, the Democrats, um, for all their rubbishness, are still, you know, better than the Republicans by Agreed, yes. Way. Yeah, the Democrats don't have Nazis running in their party. Yeah, yes. I mean, I'm still, yeah, they I'm still, do, but I'm, not. I'm still worried about them. Right, exactly. I mean, um, as a because because that, that's the thing with because uh, we we do focus a lot on the um especially with a lot of the upcoming new politicians because there was Bernie Sanders on one hand, but then um you know because I, I was a big fan of his, but then when Ocasio Cortez came onto the scene, I was like, yes, this is exactly what I want to hear. Um, but she well, not every, no, But I mean, she's absolutely um, like, she's bringing back this, this, this populism to the left that I think has been needed for a long time. And, and the, um, like we often see on Twitter, it seems to be that we, we're worried about the Republicans, but you know, I'm sort of worried about the, um, the Democrats as well. There's a lot of establishment mm -hmm. yeah. sort of institutionally entrenched type Democrats. Like um, I even heard comments from people, I forgot who it was, maybe, Diane Feinstein or, or um, Nancy Pelosi, the the ones mm. who are sort of in that establishment Democrat, and they sort of think, oh well, she just got in. It was just an anomaly. And it's like, well, no, people are um, embracing, you know, the 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 populist sort of um, like the the further left wing ideals of you know, what she's offering, which was evident by you know Sanders' popularity. So, mm. yeah, I mean, I'm like, way... sort of worried about the internal. Sorry, yeah. you go ahead. Wolf. Yeah, that's the. I'm sort of worried about. It. It's kind of a two pronged attack with people, people like that who seem to have a, a threat to the establishment. Um, it's the, you know, the right wing establishment of the Republican, and then to some extent, I'm also concerned about the, you know, the establishment. Um, the the sort of entrenched sort of practices that have been, you know, practiced yeah. for so long within the Democrat Party. Like mm. the way I see it, um, the Democrats is like being shot in the leg, and being left to bleed out to die. And the Republicans are like being shot in the lung or the heart or something and being left to die. Yeah. You're going to die much quicker from the shot in the heart, but you're still going to die. You know, we're still going to run out of time. And if you at least have more time to get help and to, you know, fix the wound, then that's better. But obviously, you know, you're still going to be <laughs> you're bleeding out if you don't get the help. Um, or another way, um, you know, a cancer. And not in the Mimi, oh, this is cancer type of way. Yeah. I mean, like a literal mm -hmm. degeneration of your cells and the killing right. of the organs and tissue in your body. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you can halt it. You can, you know, um, have chemotherapy and kill some of those cells. But if you don't get rid of the cancer, you're going to die. You're, you know, you're not going to have a body that works. You're going to have, like, you know, tissue and organs which have been killed off by 
your you know, by the cancer by the um, decay of your you know inner functions, um, and that's capitalism in a nutshell. And while the Democrats, you know, <laughs> you're not going to take the worse option. You know, Democrats are still light years ahead of Republicans, but it's not enough. And like you said, Wolf, um, you know, Cortez, um, who's not even, you know, she's, she's not a socialist, like you know, many yeah. of these like oh, red scare okay. people okay. seem to think. Oh, like, they're saying, oh, she's a, she's a, oh, they're something. saying she's a communist or whatever, but she's mm. um, you know, um, the, probably a social democrat, which is, well, you know, it's kind of, kind of in line with my, my own sort of personal philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there like needs that. to be something said here, which is that um, politically, or at least political career-wise, she's a social democrat. We can't we can't say what she's personally thinking. She might be a socialist personally, but right. her political platform is not socialist. Neither is right. Bernie, and right. and Bernie, especially because we know a lot more about Bernie's life. Bernie does seem like, at least in his personal life, he at least when he was younger was a socialist, but he's never politically. He's always politically been more social democratic, but yeah, we can't we can't know what they're thinking. But definitely, certainly their policies are social democratic. But they're uh, especially with AOC, like she's really good at at hitting on a lot of the wording or like the the like the things that other people won't say. Like Bernie still stay, stays pretty like um, sort of like in the liberal definition of politically correct, where he says things that don't really challenge the status quo as much he's kind mm -hmm. of like working within the status quo to move things left whereas aoc is actively countering the status quo just by everything she says constantly and she's been very consistent about that so yeah i think i think that needs to be said yeah no of course and i think that um using every axis we have to um you know move forward is really important so just because we're aware of the failings of you know our you know horrible state politics and our dreadful you know unfunctioning democracy doesn't mean we can still try and use it um you know we still have a um, medium there even if it's a flawed one and as long as we're also combining it with you know every axis we can uh, you know like protesting the street using um internet using every medium we have it's still a positive you know like for instance if the democrats um were in charge of the us if labor are in charge of the U you know the uk if we have left-wing social democrat parties winning elections yeah sure it's not going to just solve capitalism they're not going to just suddenly have socialism you know they're not even socialists mm -hmm. but you know suddenly you've got more actual um you know progress even if it's marginal, you've got more money being given into welfare programs, you've got more money being put into, um, you know, education and stuff and healthcare. And yeah, sure, it's not going to solve everything. We're not going to fix the world by electing, um, you know, Sanders, Sanders as president. But it's a start and every yeah. improvement is still an improvement. I think, yeah. um, you know, we got to consider that the world did not get to where it is today just by one person saying, like, let's mess things up. You know, one capitalist <laughs> didn't just suddenly snap his fingers and, like, ruin the planet. You know, it's yeah. a result of um, so many decisions and actions and, you know, the course of power structures throughout history. And if we're going to break it down and make things better, you know, we're going to have to work bit by bit along every avenue. And yeah, you know, obviously the planet is in a pretty dire state given how, you know, the environment's not doing so great. But at the same time, you know, that still doesn't mean we can't try and focus um, forward in the, you know, in one such avenue. Um, you know, it's like, um, what's it called? Using, you know, I can't think of an analogy right at this second, but, um, you know, we can use each and every avenue to make progress every victory is a victory regardless of how small and as long as they're all combined as long as the efforts of every single axis to improve um are used we can focus like i've said yeah. that like five times in just like different <laughs> wood. <laughs> yeah well i think another thing to say is that um a lot of people on the left are looking at uh historical revolutions and they don't understand that even every historical revolution has been different and right. that the west has a very different 
definition needs to have a very different definition of what revolution is because there is some places like in Syria where their country has been shattered and that was a a I mean obviously it's a horrible event but that was a prime opportunity for something like a revolution to happen because you you have your your you have people that are willing to fight you have guns you the uh government's weakened and you can take land like it's it's a very different situation whereas that's never going to happen in the west and we need to understand that you can still have a revolution without having guns and killing capitalists or guillotines or all that crap like you can you can still have a revolution and i think that there's a lot of revolutionary actions that have nothing to do with violence or any of that and and that's i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily say someone like uh, Bernie Sanders or AOC are are revolutionary, but they're right. certainly it, it compared to the status quo, maybe. Mm -hmm. But they're but they're at least stepping stones that that yeah. uh, we can continue to move the momentum left. Is mm -hmm. is a it, they're they're good stepping stones. Yeah, yeah, change can come in all forms, and be it yes. through you know literally um, fighting away fascists in the street via Antifa, mm -hmm. or yes, yes. yeah, that's um, a good point too. Or be it, you know, through um, educative meme memes, educative <laughs> memes. Memes, memes can work though. No, though, seriously, memes did actually work to me because, <laughs> like, I, and not that like I was far reactionary on like Black Lives Matters, but I was indifferent until someone said, "Stop defending police officers gunning unarmed black men in the streets," and I'm like, "Fuck, you're right." Yeah, I shouldn't defend that. Absolutely. So memes can work. It can sway some people. So social media can be a part of it as well. Part of it as well. And yeah. yes, we should not only should we own and control the mean means of production, we should also own and control the memes of production as well. And <laughs> I say the left memes far better than the right, judging from my Twitter. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. We and, um, we tend to get the the dregs in our mentions. I think. <laughs> um, I do want to address, you know, the um, what do people think of the idea presented by um, left tube celebrity Garrett that the reactionaries will always take up arms against a social revolution, and thus it is necessary for the proletariat to always maintain arms any moment because at any moment the reactionaries may take up arms, and so everyone should be armed. I think that that's a, a good thing to have a discussion on, but uh, I don't think that it's necessarily always true. I mean, like, here's what I'm thinking. I'm I'm a military history is my thing. I do a lot of military analysis and I know a lot about the US military and NATO militaries. Uh, there's never going to be a situation where y it's gonna matter. <laughs> like in a, in a macro scale, like you might save your life uh, which is good. So if yeah. you want that protection, great. But don't think it's part of a revolution. That's part of self-defense, which is good. Self-defense is a huge part of of living in the modern world. But mm. it's not like a thing that's going to to sway the tides. And also, you have to remember that a lot of people read theory and they think, hey, a lot of this theory is saying we need to be ready at any moment. But you have to remember that a lot of this theory was written when like a, some of it was when muskets were still used, but a lot of it was when bolt action rifles or or that mm -hmm. type of thing was used. Uh, that a revolution was a lot easier than uh, logistically because the arms weren't so advanced. Like the the there's back then a military rifle and a civilian rifle were almost identical. Nowadays they're so far different. Like in in Canada, especially getting a hunting rifle is really easily, but you cannot have. Uh, an AR-15 or an AK, uh, uh, so it's it's just important to understand that while I agree it's valid to use these for self-defense or something, it's there are chances that a full-scale revolution would ever happen. It's just unlikely. Now, all of course, I'm going to separate this from uh, from racial discussion because I would never say to another race like you can't have this for like that. Like I, I wouldn't do that because I I can't understand. Like I, I can't speak for them to say like what what would you consider to be reasonable for self defense? But uh, I know that on a macro scale, it's just not gonna it's not there, an armed revolution in America, Canada. These things are unlikely. And the and here's what I say: I would never say it's impossible, but I would say don't depend on it. Like we have to have our we have to be working in ways that are much more practical because we can't it we can't assume that it's gonna happen. Is it not the case that um, a lot of people um, tend to um, 
see things as unilateral and just you know, 2D. It's like, oh, it's going to be this way or that way. Um, much like a, you know a single choice option in a in a you know, survey, yeah. when yeah. instead um, you know there should be an incorporation of all kinds of things. So you know the self defense, the you know um, having practical you know armed um, you know co um, what's it called counter defense against counter defense um, self defense. There we go against you know the obvious far right um, presence that is ex exists yeah. both in the state and independently um you know all those things also um using the clear and massive benefit of communication and the internet you know we um unlike the people who you know were alive back in the 1800s um we have communication with someone on the other side of a planet you know a collective of workers has never been more united in theory because of the you know the fact that we have an almost have a universal language via the internet um yes. you know we have all yeah. these tools which we can use to progress um ideas and thoughts and you know all sorts of um better ways because it's you know it's not just about fighting and like oh you, know, you gotta yeah, kill, yeah, kill kill a million people and then we'll win it's like that's obviously not you know, the, the whole point the whole point is liberation and freedom mm -hmm. and sometimes you know people um you know, it's better to speak to you know some and you will make more progress and obviously you know i'm not i'm not trying to say oh we're going to talk our way to victory or whatever i'm not kind of <laughs> yeah i'm not trying to say that like um yeah i just like blossom the fruits of knowledge or something and it will just magically you know the, the heart will grow three times and the capitalists will just you know, suddenly <laughs> lay down their <laughs> guns and say oh it's all yours but you know um progress can come through so much more than just oh this method or that method you know it should be all in all incorporating and you know not no one person has just some massive um blueprint to doing it it's yeah. the effort of you know quite literally workers around the world you know people um of the working class uniting and putting all their ideas together um and you know seizing control through the justified reclamation of our produce and our, you know, world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And subsequently, I feel as though um, too much is, uh, I guess, held against the idea of the left um, in the sense, that, oh, you know, oh, you don't know exactly how a revolution is going to go. It's like, well, you know, no one knows what's going to happen in the future. Like yeah, no one's a no one's a prophet. Yeah. No one's a um. Nobody, nobody knows. Nobody knows how effective of the fucking wall is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we've, we've got pretty good predictors that it's going to be pretty useless. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. for some things we can see the wall is going to be a bit, a bit of even, a shambles. Even for what it was trying to do, it would be immoral and should be gotten rid of anyway. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's not going to be vandalized and ruined pretty quickly anyways, but uh, I do want to touch on some of the stuff that's been said in the chat because it is kind of my wheelhouse, but uh, uh, Garrett did sort of elaborate on what he was saying, and uh, I do think that um, if we're going to touch on Rojava, that yes, there is a good model there that we can take some lessons from, which is I think everyone should who wants to at least, I, I'm not going to force anyone, but I think everyone should try to get trained to use firearms um and to understand the basics of that and also communication like using a radio and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and other communication tactics and just basic survival stuff like compass and all that but i also think that um that a really good model with that was that um rojava um anyone who wants it and most people are encouraged heavily to do it is they get uh up to um the asayish which is the um their police um they get trained up to that standard. Um, so the police standard and, and how they do, they have self-policing there. So everyone gets trained how to use a firearm, how to handle um, sexual assault cases, like uh, all this basic stuff. And it's really useful because uh, even though they're still in a transition, um, they're already prepared for basically any any situation that happens. And, uh, and then talking at the other angle, um, for the arms networks type things, we can also take a lot of lessons from that because um, the the SDF gets a lot of arms through the PKK, especially recently, um, which is a, a network where they're they are allies who are getting arms 
to them and fighters to them, supplies, basic medical stuff through very abnormal networks like that are very different from what we think. It's not like transport ships or trucks or convoys or stuff. There's there's very alternative ways of doing that, which are we can study definitely, I think is is important. And it's again, it's it's this thing where if ideally we can get to a better world without this kind of stuff, but also it's good to be prepared for the worst. Yeah. And and like just yeah. I mean because I um so I no, you, you go ahead and I yeah, think. exactly. That's we should, what, like, should, we should disperse with the idea that there won't be any resistance from the capitalist class. I mean, there's always been yeah, resistance yeah. from any yeah, owning class once they're when when people seek to deprive them of their property, of their yeah. method of exploitation. Yeah. However, I really find quite annoying and alienating this kind of mystification and this glorification of revolution and especially violence. Like there's some people on the yeah. left who seem to love the thought of killing so many people. It just oh, provides yeah. them with such glee, and it's it's very strange to me. I mean, you know, it's um, one thing. I mean, it's one thing to, to fear fair, about throwing a brick. <laughs> to, so, sorry, um, sorry to interrupt. To be fair, um, whilst this isn't me personally, um, if someone who has been you know oppressed and you know, treated abysmally has somewhat of a um, you know feeling of uh, not necessarily um, joy, but sort of um, anticipation of you know overthrowing people and stuff. Uh, I can't. It's, say I bl- it's more sadism, I think. Mm. Well, I mean, yeah. Think of, think of the um, think of the slaves in um, you know Haiti, for instance, overthrowing um, their you know them, um, owners and stuff. Like I, I, I find it somewhat futile to focus. Like, I, I get that some people are a little bit too like oh you know oh yeah <laughs> for sure some people like are get actual joy from it I think for yeah, a yeah. Thera- for a therapeutic thought I think it's good but I don't think anyone should be getting joy from it I don't think anyone should be like getting glee from the thought of killing other humans that just seems like a stance yeah. whereas even if they got to a point where they actually could overthrow their oppressors violently I feel like that precedent is actually bad for a post. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I, yeah. I think right. no, and, and this is why I think it's important to challenge the attitudes among our revolutionaries. You know, among sure. you know left wing circles, not just to excuse all behavior because oh we're oppressed. You know, it's okay there because right. we're oppressed. It's everything's okay. We can just permit ourselves to be nasty and awful. No, yeah. we have to maintain. I froze. You know, we need to maintain a sort of discipline. We need to maintain a sort of you know, a, a, a better nature because yeah, I do believe there will be violence. I do believe that there's going to need to be some hard decisions. And I do need, I, I, I think there's probably, I, I don't think that we live in the world where everyone hugs and everyone sings Kumbaya and everyone lives happily yeah. ever after. I, However, I, what we, we really do need to worry about this sadism because in the past it's really led revolutions astray when the main point of your leftism becomes hating the oppressor more than it becomes about helping the oppressed and building a better world, you've left leftism behind. You've just entered into a kind of, you know, a Mm. kind of sadistic madness. Um, I I think, I I think even in like a curiosity has like noticed that she has spoken about this, that like she sometimes in like Antifa discourse or something like that, she she feels this like energy of this achievement of just like, yeah, let's punch Nazis. And it's like, it should be too for self-defense because like anti-fascism, we have to like fight as well as we can against fascism and stuff like that we shouldn't be gleeful about being able to punch another person and stuff like that and just like how like um bronx bronger mentioned on the hangout i did with like other uh, anarchists is that um he said listen let's not uh, the guillotines it's not a serious part of our actual platforms and stuff that we can meme about that sure well we're talking about it in jest and stuff like that and that's uh, and that's fine but we shouldn't seriously be about like killing yeah. other people and stuff like that even if they've yeah. done us wrong and stuff like that so i don't i too agree with your point that we should like not glorify violence and stuff like that violence is necessary and violence, and i hope for i hope for a non-violent revolution but uh it's uh i i, I do i do agree with all your points i would just leave it at that yeah. um I, i'd say that um I, I do agree um 
and I, I obviously you know i'm not i'm not trying to say oh yeah you know there's no issue or anything i just um i know i don't see it as um as colossal a um sticking point as perhaps you know the um i, I don't see it as the you know the focus of stuff like I, I don't see it as um such a um blight upon stuff that it's you know it's it's something that is less of oh, no, i don't say importance but um it's not high up on the priority list in my opinion because i i don't see it as such a problem i i, I believe in the better nature of um, a lot of left-wing people i think that well it's true that a lot of people are angry I, I don't think that crosses the line into just outright sadism a lot of the time and yeah sure some people yeah I, i'm not gonna you know obviously there's people who are you know a bit questionable um but uh it's not something that i consider as um frequent. when i when i think of people talking about you know um guillotine jokes and stuff and um thinking of uh what's it called uh, eating rich and stuff you know i i, I you know it's stuff that it, it doesn't have any real effect on me it's the expression yeah, exactly. it isn't to use going back to something that you said amelia um about uh self-defense and self-policing and all those you know those good things i see them as incorporated into information and sort of a given for just you know advancing humanity in general like i think it's very important for people to be taught how to um in the event of crisis and the in the events that you know beget it be taught how to defend themselves how to you know cope for instance if they were um in the wild in the event of scenarios which i don't think is something that would be you know because a lot of people think oh everyone's gonna have to become a soldier it's like well you know no one has to become you know, have to become um total recall arnold schwarzenegger you know battling your way no, around with like no. machine guns and stuff but you know it's not going to be as difficult to um introduce proper um education along that form into um you know people of a left-wing persuasion you know um especially I mean, I'd be, I'd be useless. I mean, the, that's well, it's the one you, thing you're that... An, um, you're an educator, Wolf. Well, yeah. You, no, you, yeah. I should have rephrased, I should have phrased it differently. You wouldn't be useless because everyone has something that they're good at. I When I say people should yeah. learn these things, I mean, like, uh, just the basics, like, be familiar with firearms because it, and this is what I, this is the main reason why, and this is the main reason why they do it in Rojava. It's not so that every single person can be a huge part of the military it's so that you get used to them being around and the safety of them because if you live in an yeah. environment like if you if you're in this situation where there is a revolution and you're all in the same building and there's guns laying around everyone needs to know how to use a gun because uh it's just in emergency situations and for safety if you pick it up you don't want to accidentally fire it and all that stuff but also i think i should have expanded on it differently uh this includes like medical training, basic medical training, uh, mm. basic navigation, because uh, power outages are frequent in revolution where they, the state will cut power to regions where it's destabilized in order to to sort of like smoke them out um, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, and, and for communications, you need radio, but you also need alternative forms of communication because they have radio blockers. Um, mm. it, it's stuff like this where you need to it, everyone's good at something and everyone needs to be to be getting the basics down for the main stuff and then using their what they're good at like for me exam as an example i study a lot of this military stuff so i understand guerrilla tactics and i understand basic like low level tactics i could help with that and i can do map navigation and radio usage and other people have other things like you might think that something you you know is useless but there's cases where stuff like this always comes up where like if if you know something it can come in, in a key moment it can be very useful mm, yeah because yeah, that's uh, i mean i think because obviously as a lot of people said you know you don't want that i mean a certain sadism where people sort of take pleasure in the idea of just violence for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, I mean, it can take a little, 
a teeny bit of pleasure if you like um you know break a little window here and there or maybe no that's completely fire. different i mean like hurting that's, other humans that's killing the, that's the, I mean, yeah i i think like the the like pleasure in like killing other people right yeah and and the reason i think it's a problem I don't think it's a problem when you're memeing or whatever, but I think the reason it's a problem is because, uh, and I actually do think it's relevant, is because I, I was studying a lot of these revolutions, like the Russian Revolution and, and these these failed revolutions that ultimately just resulted in a, another another state that wasn't wasn't anti-capitalist. Um, yeah, another oppressive system. Yeah, is that they did take sort of a, a sadistic pleasure in in killing and maiming and hurting other people and you will notice that in the very violent russian revolution there was a lot of the glee and the overthrowing i mean i i don't want to speak for all of it like obviously there was movements that were much more grounded but there was some like the bolsheviks and soviets were very violent people doing very violent things and afterwards it didn't change the gulags were another form of violence and there was a lot of imprisonment assassinations and they went to war and it was a very violent war it was a justified war but it was still very violent there was no end to soviet violence it just the entire length of the state was just an extension of the violence. And that's what we need to understand is that if we're having a violent revolution, we need to understand that it is a necessity and that it has to stop after after it's over. We can't keep yes. going on with the violence. The violence yeah. is, is a transitional, uh, violence is transitional. And once it's over, it needs to fade away at, or, mm -hmm. or stop because yes. otherwise it will just, the, another system. Violence is, yeah. in, violence is in a way a form of hierarchy. It is someone, inflicting a, a power onto someone else that that can hurt them or take their life and that needs to be considered it needs to be yes. considered that that needs to be limited as much as possible a war is very different from a, a peace a peaceful state or at least a transitioning to a peaceful state is you don't want you, you, do, you don't want it it to continue on so it's it's just something to consider and everyone needs to consider you can yeah. you can have pleasure in the idea but uh, of like breaking windows, overthrowing it, or just the generic idea of a, rev a violent revolution. But the yeah. specific sadistic pleasure in killing other people, I think, is definitely a problem because then it will, after the revolution, just continue on. Yeah, yeah. that's sort like, of what I was um, like. I think perhaps my problem was that I thought we were conflating um, people being sort of happy that things were going to change and thus, you know, justifiably angry and. No, 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 yeah. No, I, I think there's there's justifiable rage at oppression. Yes. That's fine. Yeah, and even the thought of, of um, there's rage at oppression and politics that have transformed from liberation into, you know, sadomasochism. Yeah, but I feel as though um, the um, the whole point of violence in the first place is to like liberate and to you know get rid of the it's, you know it's counter violence it's inherently counter yes. violence because yes. the whole reason for violence is just to you know forget the violence being enacted on you both from the capitalist system and from the you know the capitalists slash fascists who are going to then fight you to mm. restore their power like i you know I'm, I'm not trying to say that it's not a problem i just think that um you know i am um, like for instance um so the Soviets, you know, people within the, um, the you know, the Bolsheviks and the, like the, yeah, I think of Stalin and stuff. Um, I don't see that as a communist who ended up being too violent. I see that as a clear manipulative factor within Bolsheviks, you know, <laughs> within yeah. Russian circles that, you know, clearly played his cards right, ended up with a massive amount of power and thus, you know, Co Co-opts things like no, it's like you said with um you know the the essentially another place of hierarchy. Um, I, I feel like I'm um perhaps not wording this properly, but essentially violence. Um, while something <laughs> I'm talking rubbish. <laughs> when you know the idea that people um that are you know that there's um I, I guess we we are all conditioned to see all forms of violence as bad regardless of the context that it exists in and i worry that when we describe um or when we go too far with um describing things as um 
sadomasoch- sadomasochistic, like you said, Dapis. Like, while it does apply in some cases, I worry that we end up giving too much credence to um, somewhat no, ideas like that come ac- about from um, critics of left wing discourse. Like, you know, the people who are like, oh, you know, those leftists are just a bunch of violent thugs who go around, you know, just destroying stuff. And it's like, um, it feels like sometimes it's born of that to a degree. I, 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 and here's the thing. If we're criticizing it within our own ranks and trying to actively improve whatever flaw there may be, we discount the narrative that the left are just hypocrites who condemn far-right violence but perpetrate their own violence willy-nilly without any reason. I believe that there is you know, justifiable violence. I think everyone does. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least anyone who's actually thinking about the issue and who isn't a pacifist would would agree that there is justifiable violence. Um, my my issue is, um, you know, there there are there are people who are are larpers who aren't serious about left wing politics, and you know, and and it doesn't necessarily have to mean that I hate them forever. It just means that you know, you have to talk to them. You have to try to improve them. You know, oh, cool. leftism isn't just about improving the outside world. It's also about improving our own spaces oh, and cool. making them better spaces for activists to work in and making them more approachable spaces for people in the public. Yeah, yeah no, I completely agree with that. Yeah. I mean, okay. like with with other when other people like point out, it's like you said this thing is like, oh, that's like a bit of like a and then so I self fragment it's like, wait a minute, did I say something ableist? And then my like, think pad is like, oh well, yeah, oh, okay, okay. I see what I did wrong. And so if I know what I did wrong, I apologize instead of being like, No, that's not what I said. No, yeah. what's wrong with you? Yeah, Something like yeah. that. Yeah, so I have to if Another leftist is like come to me and saying something that they don't like about me, but what I'm doing, I I should uh, or as I hope I like to, and I think I have in the past, reflect on what I said and what I did, and see if I can do better, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so, I feel. Um, so, so were you going to say something, Amelia? No, no. I was just saying self reflection is very important. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Of course, yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And I, think you, I mean, have be... some skepticism. Give yourself like two, because I use the twenty-four hour rules. I mean, it's not that it's happened to me before, but I've, I've, I've sort of made this point to a lot of people. Like they sort of, you know, someone may call you out, and you know, there's two options. You may be like wrong, or you may be, like, you may not have done something wrong. Like it may be the other person who's at fault so you know as long as you critically reflect on it and you know um don't jump to a conclusion straight away because i think people do that straight away they jump straight to a conclusion and yeah they might get defended but i'll just say like sleep on it overnight and you know and then react accordingly the next day and yeah exactly you know people are um you know more than just two-dimensional cutouts um (laughs) having said that though uh, i wanted to talk about something i saw today um i um, recently retweeted a um, meme you shared, Geek, a very good one, about how um, it was, you know, the inane distribution um, of resources and you know, stuff under capitalism. Um, I and get, how, I've been getting a lot of retweets from that meme, so it yeah. Was, uh, you know, it's very prescient. Um, you know, how the, um, you know, the banker takes 19 of the cookies and then tells the worker that the immigrant is going to steal the one. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would even argue that, you know, the worker is also sort of the immigrant as well, um, mm-hmm. but well, you know. especially in the American context. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Exactly. Um, That's a good point. Yeah. Exactly. Um, in the replies to this, you know, obviously there was, a, you know, the, the oh, um, this is communism, communism in a mean, and it was um, no stock found or something. It was like essentially saying, oh, you've all starved. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I looked at the yeah. people who'd liked it, and I saw a Confederate flag, and I thought, well, this is interesting. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. And then I went onto their account, and it was like white nationalist. Um, cons- in fact, let me go to the tweets. I'll screen share. Hold on. <laughs> sure. Um, I, my tweet is being I'm, screen shared by Owen McDonald and you do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Geek. Um, <laughs> but remember, like, I've been drinking. <laughs> yeah, it exemplified so much of what I wanted to um, sort of focus on. Like, right, here we go. Um, so uh, mini content warning for the sort of stuff I'm about to show you. Mm-hmm. Um, how do I, why do I switch the screen share button? There we go. Um, that one there. 
share. Right, so oh, I um, so here's the initial um, tweet um, from the lovely, it, your current screen name, New Year Resolution Revolution, like you said earlier. Um, <laughs> capitalism distilled in a meme. So yeah, um, pretty um, basic, pretty easy to follow and, you know, um, good for Geek. You got a um, lot of retweets and likes. Um, so yeah, we've got this, you know, generic, oh, you know, you starve to death under communism, you know, ignoring the millions who starve yearly under capitalism, but, you know, yeah. part of the course. Um, <laughs> so I looked at the likes and uh, I saw this little um, golden, uh, you know, this utter st stain of a flag. Um, I, I, um, this area was made in MS Paint, by the way. I, I was wondering how to do it, but, you know. Mm -hmm. um, then I looked at their um, bio. American nationalist, former police sergeant, proud southerner, white nationalist, and identitarian. Oh, no. Oh. Hashtag oh. Oh. Hashtag, oh. Hashtag, oh. Everything the world. hashtag drain the swamp. Hashtag it's okay oh. to be white. So, you know, just every, every box ticked for, like, oh. scummy things. Um, and then I thought, okay, well, I've got three, and I've got space for one more photo. Let's find, you know, there's probably going to be some pretty bad tweets. And I was thinking, I'll just, as a screenshot, the first one I see, and I saw all of these. Um, <laughs> oh. So, um, you know, just immediately, um, but bear in mind, these are all within the period of 24 hours. In fact, less than that. How is this um, not a parody? <laughs> it's not, no. Um, so you've got the, you know, gay degeneracy, Ethnic replacement of Europeans, um, loss of culture and ethnic populations. Do you want the Mexicans to flood our country? Trace <laughs> to the USA. Uh, go back to the, to the USA. What? <laughs> yep. Um, you can see just the different account ads, by the way, just oh the various. It just goes on and on. The, the white race built Western civilization. Oh my fucking god. <laughs> it's awful, isn't it? The gays and Indians can't just leave. So um, yeah, you know, it gets worse. Um, Hang on, I thought, they, I thought they were against collectivism. They say white people like we. Yeah, because of my ancestors, <laughs> they, yeah, they exactly. built that. But nebulous. Um, well, I mean. That's the inherent hypocrisy in white nationalist ideology. They're against identity politics when it's the other side. They're yeah. pro-white identity politics. Yeah. They're pro male yeah. identity politics. Yeah. They're pro-straight identity politics. Yeah. Let's be. I mean. I mean. Let's take um as individuals. Let's take a um like collective view of our achievements. Like all the good stuff, but then the bad stuff. No, that they're, they're dead. We didn't have anything to do with that. Yeah. Um, and then these two were well, not these two. This one was one of my um, <laughs> one of my most really revealing ones. Pinochet may have been quite brutal, but he both saved Chile from communism and brought an economic miracle to the country. You know when he um, trashed the country of its you know political freedom, uh, and he and he also he described them as non-compliant people as well. But, you know, <laughs> just just in case the fascism wasn't you know clear enough already. Oh. <laughs> And then the one underneath is just, you know, the usual transphobia. Um, yeah. But I just, oh, by the way, I... it's just a, a compilation of just awful, awful opinions. Um, you know, and <laughs> just it exemplifies the sort of person that is, you know, avidly against the um, far left. It's you know, essentially just a fascist, basically. You know, just this <laughs> yeah. awful, like, stain on society um, using their voice online to you know pretty much every single white supremacist box basically you know um and it's you know the consequence of a um system which built you know, it's built around capital built around maximizing power over others you know you um of course divulge into um you know racism the idea that white people are better than black people and thus as a form of power over them have the right to you know commodify their countries and you know take their humanity away from them as a form of maximizing power. The, um, what's it called? Uh, oh, someone's going to say it then. Uh, Anti-LGBTQ stuff, you know, that, um, ma ma that contributes to the um, patriarchal view of society because, yes. you know, it's the man of a woman, you know, the wife in the house doing the household labor for free, um, you know, for the man to, um, you know, sit on top of the hierarchy and thus benefits yeah. from that unpaid labor. Um, and, you yes. know, the fact that um, queer people exist is like, mm -hmm. oh, well, they can't exist because then it would question our hierarchy because it's like, oh, well, suddenly we're not going to be on top if, uh, thank you, geek, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to be on top if, um, you know, 
we're acknowledging the existence of non-binary people and you know people who aren't in a heterosexual relationship and stuff and people who can um you know people who change gender and stuff and the yeah. idea that our entire model of science is completely like outdated and wrong and so it become you know the anti-lgbtq stuff is in part affected by that um and every single you know axis for discrimination you know was there because that's the sort of person that is um you know co the consequence of being anti-communist anti you know progress essentially anti yeah. liberation of workers and you know at one point that guy was probably just you know your typical right winger he was just oh you know i don't like the commies and all that but yeah. over time their hatred for anti-communism boiled over and allowed them to be co-opted by a far right to the point where you get someone yeah. literally waving around a confederate flag you know and scarily enough he was in the police he was in the police force that should to me yeah, so he's a retired policeman, not a yeah. current policeman. Also, oh, you know, he was probably like, you know, one of the ones who was like, oh, you know, Jim Crow should never have ended. I mean, it's not even a probably. He literally, you know, white <laughs> nationalist. Hey, yeah. all those who join forces are the same who burn crosses. A line from a Rage Against Machine song. And that song was from the 90s, and yet many of Rage Against Machine songs today is still relevant today. In it's fact, still they're like, work. still yeah. work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, uh just uh i want to mention the, the, i want to mention that the last tweet from that confederate flag account was a reply to uh, nick fears or something like that uh they're going to be on a hangout uh tomorrow on garrett's channel the internet leftist celebrity who's still in the chat yay garrett <laughs> and and he's going to have a uh live stream on his channel uh with h barber guy uh, and, and lacking sense as well as like nick fear so like shout out to like garrett on this small 820 uh channel youtube channel but still and uh i also i want to credit that like uh, that was a facebook post that was shared on my facebook and i I saw that from my friend Marty, uh, who is a trans woman herself. But that was from the Facebook group called Red Labor. So look oh. on Facebook Red Labor because it's like it's actually it's a British group essentially that likes it's kind of like yeah basically like wants to like still like continue progress into like socialism and communism and stuff like that. I think it's something like that. So I want to give credit to credits due. I don't know who originally posted that thing and took the photo. I don't know that, but at least there, those were my sources for the meme that I posted that got like, what, 700 retweets or something like that? No, 700 likes and 200 retweets. What are they on Twitter I had yesterday? <laughs> more, like, more retweets. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, I need to just catch up with like, thousands of videos from hundreds of different content creators because you know there's loads I, of great people out there panels. um and certainly yeah. if you're if you're watching this then you need to be watching the other people like i this is like the bargain basement of like <laughs> youtube on, on my channel with like <laughs> zero well, 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 let's start on your stuff. you're quite in uh, short in this hangout <laughs> Who knows? On yourself, Owen. You're quite insightful. Well, thank yeah. you very much, Lapis. <laughs> so like, so Garrett, where's Garrett been? Like, he's off. He disappeared. It he left and then he returned. Reasons. Was it not just a he break? Just had, see, I told you, see, I told you New Zealand was so. I told you New Zealand was dangerous. Like, everyone's <laughs> saying, oh, Australia, everything's out to kill you. But then, like, you know, New Zealand YouTube, as they go missing for a long period of time, they fall down, you know, volcanoes and, <laughs> you know, geysers and shit. To, well, to be fair, to be fair to Garrett, he did have his second channel, the Magic Theater, which is great for film analysis and stuff like that. And like uh, oh, his uh, Avengers videos is like really excellent. Or I love that video. He's, the, my only problem with like his channel is that like a lot of the videos that he puts up that I still haven't watched. He says you must have watched this, you must watch this. I was like, oh crap. Okay, so the void spoilers. I have to watch all these movies and TV shows before I watch this video and stuff like that. But when I eventually came, no, I did see homecoming and then i watched this his video about like anti-heroes and uh the villain in a, a homecoming vulture and i thought oh that was a really good video oh man and it's, it's one of those kind of like a leftist video essay videos where it's just like it's about like movies and stuff like that and i and when i when i watch a video that makes me like love the movie that they're talking about more i don't i always like those kind of videos and stuff like that wow i didn't see that angle to like spider-man homecoming or to like even some of my favorite directors like satoshi Kone, 
Every Frame of Painting did a great video on Satoshi Kon, my one of my favorite directors. But anyway, mm. well, no, I think um, that's sort of the beauty of um, I, I say beauty, <laughs> like so it's, it's quite self indulgent. But I think one of the um, bit, like left wing ideas are designed to you know challenge injustice to you know look at society in more depth than just saying oh this is the way things are and in many ways art is such a great medium for challenging that um to the point where many of the best pieces of art challenge the way we think about society um mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds so like pretentious and you know but um i at least we're aware of that think, things like the wire you know the sopranos oz Breaking oh, Bad. The they, I need to watch a wire. They are, you know, they're my favorites. Um, they're my, you know, go to the Neon Genesis Evangelion. Um, oh yes, I oh, saw that in VHS. I did. You were into anime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like anime gets um, a bad. I think because anime is a lot of people see animation as oh, you know, it's for kids. It can't be good. Which, yeah. firstly, kids shows you know lots of effort is put into them because they have to write in a medium that obviously is aimed at younger people, but also has to have, you know, when it's when care is put into it, it's you know it's fantastic. It's there can be really brilliant portable pieces designed for um, you know children, um, but like anime the mystery, right? obviously, um, you know, it's. It comes from a you know different set of studios and stuff to you know, the West, where it's you know, somewhat less commodified. I say. Well, I mean, I don't know enough about the history of Japan. Obviously, they still do um, have their you know their commodification stuff. Um, but you know, compared to some of the schlock that you see on like Western um, TV, sometimes um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of you know really amazing programs. Um, that come from Japan, which sort of dismissed as oh, it's kid stuff, or even you know even worse, dismissed as just like trash porn or whatever. Um, as as though that you know, as, uh, firstly, as though that just inherently makes it worse, but secondly, um, it ignores what's been go going on in it. Like Neon Genesis Evangelion, um, you know, is one of the best pieces of artwork of all time. Just the themes it explores in a very low budget when you think about it. Um, yes. Only one season. Um, the final mm -hmm. two episodes weren't even finished. Like the way they managed to mm -hmm. salvage, uh, you know, running out of money, is outstanding. Um, yeah, I could talk about it all the time, all, all day. But um, just things like that, like pieces of art which are so well thought out. Like the writing in those shows I just mentioned, from David Chase and David Simon. Um, you know, people who have mastered the art of language and conveying stuff. And actors like James Gandolfini and Edie Falco and stuff. Um, Idris Elba, uh, who else? Just so many. Um, I, yeah, I, could, I could be here all day. Um, it's fantastic. You know, it's sort of stuff um, which is so crucial to um, not just, you know, film and art, but just life itself. Think of The Wire. And think of how, you know, has anyone here seen The Wire? I need to, because, like, Garrett, who's in the chat, he's a big fan of The Wire, and I heard nothing but great things about The Wire. And, well, like, Garrett just... It's the best TV show ever. It's the best, you know, it's, like Garrett has literally just put in the chat, it's about the evils of capitalism and bureaucracy. It literally shows the decay of the American system because of the, you know, the hierarchies and the corruption and, essentially, the things that are so inherent to capitalism they affect all walks of life you know the the way that policing is so you know morally and um logically bankrupt but it ends up just making things worse the way the, the season two which you know lots of people think oh season two's the worst one no it's outstanding because it shows you how workers are just the cogs of a system you know used maximizing their profit out of them and then just dumped and left to rot where you know hard-working people who have been you know on the docks their entire lives are generations used you know essentially as just you know parts of a machine by the wealthy and then as soon as they get a better machine they're just left to you know die off on the docks you know on, a, on docks where there's no jobs yeah um the third season where we just look at the you know the political world we look at Amsterdam. you know we look at how um if people actually put a bit of thought into it you know the drug problem wouldn't be such a drug problem there wouldn't be 
you know, such issues. But instead, you know, it's all about, oh, let's make our statistics. Let's just get our arrest numbers up. Let's, you know, let's put Carchetti in as mayor who only cares about making himself better and literally votes against or literally like, you know, sabotages the progress that could be had for his own benefit. Um, you know, look at just see the school season. The school season was outstanding, you know, where um, we've got child actors. Child actors are, you know, often slated. But the children in this show who are like 14 and 15. They're amazing. You know, it's like it's like you're actually in Baltimore. You're, you know, it's, it's made by Baltimore, like Baltimoreans. I, I, I don't actually know the correct term. Um, certainly people, you know, who are Baltimore through and through just, you know, who so clearly see the problems of this city if the cast like is you know there's no like oh this is the lead actor it's an ensemble cast um but many of them you know there's obviously lots of baltimore people there, there but there's people from all across america and even some british people dominic west is there idris elba's there um you know they're two famous brits um mm. the guy who plays carchetti is irish um you know it's so many people who just a part of this massive, this massive story of the American dream being this complete sham and ruining this city that, you know, has so much, it, there's so much potential and, you know, stories. Um, <laughs> I could go on and on, and I'm sure you don't want to hear me just, well, if, if I had, if I was, you know, if I had the energy to um, write a script and, and if I had the capability to edit beyond just like, you know, my shoddy stuff, I would be writing all the time about it. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's essential. Like everyone should watch it, and I'm not even joking. Like it's essential to just understand how um, our society has, you know, failed so many people, and just how hi hierarchy and you know positions of control and power, um, and just the capitalism as a whole has just failed. Yeah. End piece. <laughs> and scene. And scene. Yes. <laughs> I'm a theater other, child as well. <laughs> on the other side, though, I also really like So Bad It's Good stuff. Like, I, I've spoken to Lapis a bit on one of my streams about The Room, which is like my <laughs> one of my favorite films. <laughs> I still have not seen it. I've heard so much about it, but I still have not seen it. But I've seen videos about it, so I get the "You turn me apart" and all the other stuff. It's it's so good to just study. There's so much you can yeah. learn from it. Everything the, went wrong. The behind the scenes <laughs> stuff too, with um, Tommy was always firing actors and then hiring yes. like just extras and stuff and then literally filming the film in chronological order so when one of the actors quits he like they have to replace them with like somebody yeah. you've never seen before <laughs> or the um well, well the, um one of the, the, the chirp chirp scene where he makes um so the, <laughs> like, you're well, like a chicken <laughs> in that scene um mark has shaved. Mark's Johnny's best friend, as he tells you like 50 times. But um, Mark has shaved, um, but he, he shaved because Johnny wanted, Tommy Wiseau wanted to call him Greg Sestero, the actor playing Mark, babyface, because he's shaved. That's the only reason the scene's in there. There's no reason. There's no story. It doesn't matter apart from that Johnny, Tommy wanted to call him babyface. Let's go eat, huh? <laughs> Danny, do you have anything else? Do you, do you have any problems? You can talk to me. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Anyway, so how's your sex life? <laughs> but like the quotes are endless. It's it's an amazing film, and I think um, it's you know it's just um, a film that like the it's going to sound strange, but um, H. H Bomber guy I covered it a little bit. There are some yeah. good lessons you can take from it. In that it's and um, you know this nonsense that some people in positions of power, uh, like Tommy in this case, the person who's telling the story and whose mindset it's from, can twist the narrative to you know make it seem like they're the ones being treated badly. That you know, like we never Lisa's awful in the film. You know, right. she <laughs> just does things. But Tommy, so no the, the main character in the room is a unreliable narrator, but accidentally, as it were. <laughs> Like yeah, yeah, like Lisa, you know, she's terrible, but 
it's all just from Tommy's point of view. You know, mm-hmm. she, she starts out with him saying what a great guy Tommy is, and then all of a sudden it's just, oh, I'm bored of him now. <laughs> Let's go and date the best friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's. I mean, at the same time, even if you didn't have that view of it, um, it's you know still enjoyable nonsense. Like the the scene with Chris R, the mysterious Chris R, who shows up and for some reason he has the last name R. It's yeah, not R. <laughs> they never know. <laughs> and even Denny calls him Chris R as well. And, and he's like, "You got my money, right, Denny? Yeah, it, it's coming. It'll be here in five minutes." <laughs> Doesn't make any sense because Chris R never resurfaces. He appears in one scene, and that's it. Oh, don't you remember? They took him to jail, and as you know, if he just takes on to to a, a police station, that's the end of it. You've been never seen again. <laughs> <laughs> and it takes them like two, it takes them like two minutes as well to get all the way from the bottom of their flat to a police station and back. And like apparently, they just the police just like they'll take you in and just like send you off to prison on someone's word. <laughs> But like in the film, everyone loves Tommy too. Like he, like yeah. the ran- random shopkeeper who like just, oh, you're my favorite customer. <laughs> oh, hey Tommy, I didn't see you. Yep. Um, or the um the restaurant that he goes to with um Mark, <laughs> which the the people the barristers like barristers the baristas um they they just know Tommy and it's like, oh hi Tommy, <laughs> your is it? Can we have your? Do you want your regular? Um. The, the party where everyone's like, "Oh, Johnny's very sensitive. You mustn't hurt his feelings." <laughs> and like the thing with this, his feud with Mark, like, is um, completely out of nothing because Johnny, obviously, Mark, and what and some of he's like, "Oh, um, you know, one, he's obviously cheating on John, on ch- cheating with." He said he's obviously a part of the affair, but Johnny and Mark are completely fine. Until the party when um, <laughs> Mark and Lisa start like suggestively dancing in front of Johnny, uh, and Johnny's Johnny's like Lisa, you're my future wife. What are you doing? And Mark never like, says fiance. Have you yeah, noticed f- that? Future wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the uh, most romantic term, of course. You know, yeah, you're he wasn't like, you... super um, well versed in English, so I might just be he didn't know the word. <laughs> but he, he got so much backing though, and he like. Yeah, you'd think someone would have brought it up. I don't know. Yeah. He's, a, he's a weird person, so maybe he just ignored them. <laughs> I mean, he did, he did write, produce, edit, like, the film, I guess. So. Yeah. But, yeah, he um, Mark's like, um, maybe she's changed her mind about you. And then Mark's like, since when are you giving me orders? And, like, shoves him. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it just breaks out into fighting, where it's like... Um... <laughs> Oh, I'm firm of like, the world, it's all against me, why? <laughs> he, he says that, but he's like, um, Mark's like, oh, don't worry about it, man. And Johnny's like, don't touch me, motherfucker, get out. <laughs> <laughs> and they start, like, fighting. And then, and then um, the psychologist, well, the, set, the psychologist, like, replacement, the guy who was just introduced, like, seconds ago, so it's, like, screaming, it's over! It's over. He's like yelling it out as loud as he can for no reason. <laughs> it's over. It's just nonsense. Get out. Get out. Get out of my life. <laughs> he, like, oh. when he records the um, the phone conversations on a um, on a tape recorder. <laughs> Uh, but, but, but there's no like the cassette apparently has endless tape because he just leaves it there like the day. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's not like an old ass like eighties <laughs> yeah. deck too. It would not have nearly that much. <laughs> yeah, and he, even even like it just presses play and it's instantly at, like the conversation has just happened. Like there's no like yeah. rewinding or anything. Also, when he's attaching it to the phone, he clearly doesn't actually have he like because you can't connect one to a phone like that. <laughs> But he just like kind of just like messes with the wires for a bit and then just sets it down and walks away. It's like it's not connected in any way. Like what? <laughs> yeah, and it's like crisp, clear audio as well. Like there's no way like some horrible like '80s <laughs> rubbishy like kitty recorder is gonna have like the audio that's literally been lifted from the microphones he's used. <laughs> A good just, microphone too, because he's he splurged on the equipment yeah, for it. Yeah. It's um, and the the even the stuff that's not even that related to the film. Like he, they had a billboard of the the film up for like a decade, just one billboard on like a motorway somewhere, just like, the room, <laughs> just up for a decade, which must have cost them so much to like hire out the whole thing. Um, 
and just the like i mean i guess it's sort of um it's all right now because tommy's like a cult cult hero and the fact that like no one cared about the set because there's like framed pictures of spoons just on the walls <laughs> which like <laughs> the bit where he trashes his apartment as well Ah, why, Lisa? Why, why, why? Ah, and he's like, he's, there's a scene of him just like screaming with a camera sort of panning around the room. Um, and he's just kind of going, ah, ah, you're a bitch, you're a bitch, and like throwing bits of fruit over and stuff. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's honestly, it's my favorite. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not I'm, true. I'm, I didn't hit her. I didn't, didn't hit her. It was a lie. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> Gosh, that, and the, the scene where, like, um, so I know it's a rooftop scene with Mark, where he's on the rooftop with the, the, the initial psychologist, and from nothing, the psychologist is like, yeah. He starts, like, to try to kill him. He, yeah. he almost throws him off the building. Yeah. <laughs> the psychologist is like, oh, you're having an affair, aren't you? Just from, like, no evidence. He just deduces it. <laughs> because uh, he's Mark, a psychologist, apparently. Mark's like, his what? name is Peter, isn't it? Yeah, yeah Peter the psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, and then Mark's like, what? And then like it cuts to really dramatic music and it's a shot from like below the balcony and he's like doing this with him and sort of shaking him a bit and doing like fake clenching his teeth like <laughs> And then um then there's like a pause and they stop and it's like sorry. <laughs> 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 oh hi mark apparently took 60 takes to get the ride and it th that's the final take <laughs> oh, like they had to um they had to like um adr the lines oh, as well like, the best part of that the the oh hi mark one thing is the one that they actually went with was one of the pretty early ones too so he did <laughs> so 60 takes and many adr versions of it just for them to pick one he was not happy with any of them so they picked one that was actually kind of early in the the takes it is just, just hilarious to me how people had to sit through so well it's not it's hilarious in a morbid way where people had to sit through so much just for him to be like actually this one's fine <laughs> yeah although he wasn't obviously he was still very picky about it but yeah yeah and the um even the less notable scenes like there's a scene um where, <laughs> where um like johnny's telling us about um how he met lisa uh, and he's like well that's a very interesting story mark i met i met, I met her at a festival <laughs> he's like and at one point um oh just that like the whole scene um he goes ah, ah, like that like <laughs> just making noises <laughs> like oh gosh the um <clears throat> the drug dealer scene is something oh, yeah. else. The, the, with, the with Mark, and it, it's just not Mark the uh, the, the kid. It, it's just I haven't Maybe seen him in a while. while. But yeah, it is. <laughs> what what were you doing? Him? Giving him, selling him? Stop, stop ganging up on me! <laughs> it's just so. You know my funny. fucking mother. You listen to me, pointing. She like grabs his like collar. <laughs> he does the whiny kid really well, actually. <laughs> Oh gosh. He does sound like an asshole kid where he's just like <laughs> whining constantly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um and the um when when Johnny gets back, he's like, you know better, right? Why? <laughs> and like Lisa, despite the fact Lisa's like sort of said at this point already that she doesn't like Johnny. She's like, oh, you know, you know Johnny loves you, right? <laughs> and Johnny's like, let's go. I just came favorite. back from the doctor. I definitely had cancer. Oh, come on, mom. They're curing cancer every day. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't care. Never brought up again. Um, and like the mum keeps bringing up like all these new things. Like, oh, um, well, at least your life's interesting. I, I did nothing in my days. Uh, my husband yeah. took half the money. Never get I mean, she says like men are rubbish or something, but she's also trying to get her daughter to marry Johnny. Also, like her main plot point never pays off, where they're constantly reinforcing that she has cancer, and you think that that's something's gonna happen with it, and nothing ever comes of it. She literally just keeps saying, "Oh, well, you know, I'm dying of cancer," and it's like it never, nothing happens. By the end of the film, she's still alive and fine, as far as we can tell. <laughs> like, it's such such a weird plot point. Like, you no, think it's going somewhere, matter. and it just drops. It's, it's the world of Johnny. Only Johnny matters. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. <laughs> but also um the uh what's it called uh 
um the friend uh i can't remember his name but like it's a friend who like sneaks into the apartment to have sex because apparently oh, that's yeah happened. that scene um, is very awkward and they get caught and then he like pulls out he, he tries to take his underwear back because somehow he got changed like without putting his underwear on i don't know how like you would have covered because like she um lisa and her mum come back in and um they like quickly you know, pull their pants back up and stuff or you know the man pulls his pants back up trousers i guess but he pulls up his trousers but has his underwear off and then goes back in to get his underwear which he pulls out from like the, the thing <laughs> like the mother grabs it off him is like what, what's this and then like later on he's explaining to um um johnny and stuff johnny and Actually, no, it's, ju- it's just Johnny. He's like, uh, I've had a bit of a tragedy. <laughs> the, tra- the, the tragedy is that he um, <laughs> he, he um, got caught with his, uh, in, uh, in the apartment. And then Johnny tries to get him to tell Denny and Mark, who show up later. Um, he's like, oh, I had a um, problem with me underwears. Um, and... Mark goes, oh, un- underwear? What? But then when he's saying that, he like shoves him over. And he just pushes, he pushes the guy over, um, and like it's meant to be like he fell, but he clearly jo- Johnny uh, Mark clearly just shoves him over, <laughs> and he's like, oh, we got to take him to the hospital. <laughs> he like has walks off the set because he, like he's injured. Oh gosh, it's it's the best film. Um, it's really just. Like I I've got I've got a copy of it. It's amazing. Like oh, it is good. <laughs> we should um, probably just have a watch party where we all watch the room together or something like that. that Especially for me who I haven't watched it. I haven't seen it actually. I, I think anyone who's interested in like filmmaking or anything like that should definitely watch it. Just n- not even from like the, the common thing that's brought up where it's like, oh, uh, you need to know how not to do things, but even just because there is like a lot of really interesting things you can extrapolate Mm. from it. Like one of the most important things is to not, even if you're doing a story about yourself, to not like have the entire thing just like dead eye on your view. Like you need to have other perspectives in it because it is literally a entire feature length movie of Tommy Wiseau's view on a specific situation. (laughs) And no one else's view is expressed. It's literally his, even other scenes with him not in it are scenes you can clearly tell he thinks that's how people talk when he's not there. It's hilarious. (laughs) It's like the bit in the party, like right at the start, there's just two random guests we never see again. And we're like, Lisa yeah, there's looks, a lot Lisa of Lisa awesome characters enough. in the room. <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's just, it, it's such a, despite being a pretty short movie, it's extremely uneconomical <laughs> with its time. Yeah. There's so much to be done to have developed the characters. Have they just cut out a lot of extra, extraneous crap? And with, with like, fif- so with like 15 scenes that go nowhere. With like, yeah, with like 15 or 20 minutes of a movie left, um, he's like, I have an announcement to make. We're expecting. <laughs> and then, and then like, Lisa, Lisa just made it up to be interesting. Because, you know, that's, that's something people do. Like, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and the, fr- the friends are like, I-, I really think you should tell Johnny. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I've been like talking for one minute. Uh, um, and on a slightly uh, somber note, it's getting quite late. Um, yep. And we've been going for two hours. Um, no. So I'd like to... Uh, so, sorry, Lapis. Are we going to have to bid adieu? Just um, for now. Yeah, just for now. We'll do another one of these in another time. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you all on, and Wolf, before he left prematurely. Um, mm-hmm. It's been a hopefully entertaining and interesting conversation with politics and plenty of conversation about the room. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I hope everyone um, who watched. Uh, enjoyed the stream um definitely go and follow and subscribe to lapis and geek and a- amelia um and wolf um i'll put their um relative uh, twitters and youtubes and stuff in the um description, description. yeah thanks Geek. i almost forgot there um <laughs> but yeah um it's well into the night in the uk so i am going to go to bed um mm-hmm. i hope Thank everyone you. has a Eat lovely well. evening and yeah um yeah. be left be left wing that's that's the mole yeah. of the day. <laughs>
And as Gary would say, as Gary would say, goodbye, comrades and potential comrades. <laughs> no. <laughs>